to another episode of Boosted Rolls, a War Machine and Hearts podcast focused on EU meta, tournaments, and tactics. My name is Tomasz, and I play Circle. Hi guys, I'm Simon, and I play Circle as well. I was about to say Legion, old habits die hard. And with us today, we have three members of the England Knights team. Uh, introduce yourself, gents. Uh, hi, I'm Jake. I've uh, been on before. Hi, I'm Mark. I'm a cunt. I've not been on before. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben. I play Grimkin. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that, that pretty much describes the team dynamic, in case yeah, anyone wants to. I pretty much summed up my whole personality there, I think. <laughs> Especially the depressed voice in which you said it. I feel like yeah, yeah. Catches it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, and um, today we are here to chat about the Lund uh, Battle at Lund team tournament, um, which these guys, unsurprisingly, now that they're on the show, won. Um, but it was a five-man team tournament, so tell us a little bit about your two faithful Danes. So we, uh, we unfortunately for them, we shanghaied to lovely Danish people who didn't know what they had, what, what was in, what was in for them. First, we had on um, we had Casper. Uh, I think he's been on your cast before, the uh, the Ram player from from Denmark. He has indeed. He was the guy that whipped me out of the Danish Masters. Yep, yeah, that's the guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, re- really, really sound guy, but say does uh, just does round things to people. And then we had um, uh, Mikhail. I can't Mikhail. Whatever Mikhail, it is, I can't yeah. pronounce that name. Um, another uh, lovely bloke playing playing Grimkin. So our, our team composition for the for this event was double Ret, double Grimkin, and Scorn. It should be noted that Casper turned up expecting to play Assyria and found out on the day of the tournament that Mark also wanted to play Assyria. That's uh-huh. not entirely true. We'd already agreed between us that we were going to split Gareth II and Assyria between ourselves, with me getting Gareth II and him getting Assyria. And then on the morning, he sort of wandered over and went, do you want to play Assyria? Because your Assyria list is really interesting. I'm just like, I might as well if you're offering. So we wrote him this terrible Raven off list that he had no models for and no intention of playing. So he just one-listed Ronald. in. Really nice of him to uh, do that, especially because he's, of course, practising for WTC himself. He's forfeiting the chance to practice this area, so we really appreciate that. Oh, sound man, sound man. I mean, uh, I, I remember I, I spent a bit of time, I think Mikkel advised me to a particularly Danish pastry shop, and I'm forever thankful. Um, <laughs> so that was, you know, during, during, the, uh, during the event, that was an absolute star. Um, and... Uh, and Casper was, as, as, as you say, we've had him on the show before, and he was uh, a, a great, uh, great fella to uh, spend a bit of time chatting with. So- lovely, lovely set of, set of lads to say. I just wanted to, just to go out and thank him again for for putting up with us for a day. Uh, it was really nice to actually have him on, and they were uh, excellent sports, and just really nice to to chat with. And I don't know where Mikhail has been hiding, but Jesus Christ, he's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was pretty solid. Yeah, he's been, like, he's been where hiding this guy been hiding? He's really good. <laughs> He's been hiding in Denmark. They don't get out enough. That's the uh, <laughs> you've got to go and hunt them down. I uh, yeah, I had to go there to find out myself. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's great to hear, and, and I am surprised that there wasn't an award for that. Like putting up with you three shit for the day. <laughs> like, there was an award. They got a a plastic bowler hat covered in gold glitter. Ah, I did yes. also. Mikkel got a set of uh, Knight's widgets for his trouble as well, the set that I had from last year. Casper is unfortunately still waiting on his prize. I didn't manage to catch him before he left, unfortunately. Ah, shame. But nice of you to think of him. Cool, all right. And when you were fishing for those two players, did you look for someone that plays the same factions as your two missing teammates for WTC, or you just took whoever's available? It was... um, So, because... Because we joined the, uh, or, or me especially joined the Battle at Lund quite late. I thought I missed out on tickets, so I didn't. So I didn't. We didn't plan enough to to figure out a team um, early enough. So we just grabbed any two good players we could, and we'd figure it out from from there. Really, basically, I, 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 we didn't care about what factions they played, just as long as they were pretty good. Well, you, you kind of looked out a bit with Grimkin Rhett then. That's. Um, it's kind of nice. Well, I, I would have taken any of the factions, but I think. Of course, we've already got a good Grimkin and Rep player, and but the, the factions are both pretty stable as well. So you can you can pick and pick and mix between the casters. It's it was it was fine. Like there's there's things you can do better, but you can definitely do worse things. So it seemed fine to us. Fair, fair. Um, so talking then about the the team tournament in general, um, the format was an exact copy of WCC, as far as I remember. There was no change at all. Is that right? Exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. 
Like, what did you feel? I mean, I think the only thing that's really worth talking about regarding that team format is that, you know, everyone's kind of familiar with it. We know how it works. Um, but with the, with the loss of Hills, with the change of the scenario packet, um, with the importance of terrain, what do you think was better? Pitching, picking matchups or choosing tables? Um, Table. so, so, yeah, Ben said, so tables was, I, I feel, at the front of our, the front of our mind um, Why? going into it. The because the, the the WTC style terrain can be so so skewy, you have to you have to have constantly think about what the terrain is going to be. Because you can have a great matchup in something, but if that great matchup is fucked over by three twelve inch forest in the middle of the board, I uh, you, you it goes from a, a win to a loss. So you always have to think about tables as much as possible. Virtually every good list right now is really good at abusing favorable terrain setups as well. Yeah, and being able to get your good list, those terrain setups is much better than being able to pick one extra matchup. Go into that a little bit in more depth. So you said every good list at the moment is capable of abusing favourable terrain. Can you give me some examples? Let, let's take some obvious top factions. So Grimkin, how, what 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 do they favourably abuse? Uh, sure. So my pairing is King and Bump and Dreamer and DM. So King obviously wants something line of sight blocking in the middle. Uh, preferably Why? clouds, that's great because my army's mostly got either side, so I'm building a cloud wall off the, off the edge of it anyway. Yep. Forest also good. Um, especially now that DM is almost entirely flying, it doesn't particularly care about forest in the middle, which means that you can suddenly put your brick behind it, mirage into charge stuff, trample through, move your clocks through to spray things. Yeah. Yep. And it also means that you can protect your slow army against gun lines and kite better against stuff that you're trying to kite with your sprays. Fair enough. Jake, how does how do Scorn take advantage of abuse favorable terrain? So for well for for Zal for Zal two and Immortals in uh, in um, for Zal two mainly like my whole army can be in Corporeal, apart from like four solos. Uh, my Mammoth and my Supreme both have um, both have Pathfinder. So the terrain in the way isn't a problem for me. I can abuse things like Rubble really well. So I can sit all my Immortals in like in a big patch of Rubble and be Death Seventeen from Guns. Just, I just, just been sat there. But so far, that sounds a little bit like what you're saying is that it's not that you can abuse the terrain, it's that the terrain cannot fuck you. And what I'm suggesting is that if that's the case, if it's just that terrain cannot fuck you anymore, which I think is true for a few of the higher power factions, like Circle, don't care about terrain, Grimkin currently... It's not that they don't care about it, it's just that it doesn't fuck them. So isn't it better then to get three favourable matchups instead of two and just say, well, my list can deal with terrain, so fuck you? I express myself poorly. Um, it's really to think of it as, if I'm playing Dark Menagerie, what I have is a brick, and what I'm trying to do is win on scenario while not letting my opponent get enough stuff in that they can break my brick. And a lot of the time, the stuff that's trying to get in has to worry about things like walls being in the way, forest blocking line of sight, buildings blocking their landing zones. And all this stuff makes it easy for me to brick and protect my defensive scenario elements. So it's the point that you want to pick, you want the ability to pick a table where you have enough elements that you can perform that game plan. Yeah, and I want to be able to like put the big patch of rubble on a flag because my flag scorers are incorporeal. I want to be able to on recon to put a big building that's blocking anything. And at that point, Ben's broken his headset again. So we'll move on to Jake um, telling us. So what, is it now that we've rephrased the statement a little bit, is that basically what's happening with Zal 2 as well? That It's not that you're necessarily abusing it. It's that you've got a game plan and that the terrain really helps you to execute that game plan. Similar, yeah. So like, I, I abuse the terrain in, in a different way. So like the way that like, immortals die is they get shot from long, from long distance away. And they already have half decent stats. I mean, 13, 17 is an okay stat. But suddenly when you've got 20 guys that are, most of them are going to be Def 17 from guns, suddenly they're not dying. Then you just give off a couple of vengeance triggers, try and get people to take the bait, um, or contest in awkward places. So if you put your whole unit in a, like behind a forest or in rubble, then just one guy contesting their zone. They have to trigger vengeance, then I can move into the into the forest or through the rubble and then charge. Right, So I, okay. I abuse it in a slightly different way. Also, with the mammoth in my list, um, I want to pick a, pick a terrain side where I can cast, where I can create a defensive, like a little like, defensive sort of like fort with the mammoth. But we're not so much talking about picking sides yet, are we? We're talking about picking tables. And so when you're picking a table, are you already thinking that you're going to be able to pick side or do you need to just like, how does that work? So when I'm picking the table, I, I want the one where I can start that game plan on. So if I, if I look at a table, so say one say one spread the net, and I look at the table, 
and there is on I like, say there's like a really nice building in the center but then on one of the flags as well there's like a bit of forest covering most of the flag well i say well i know i'm not getting a side i don't know which side i'm getting but i can start my game plan from that table knowing where my models are going to go okay okay and mark how does that how does this all reflect on ret like what a ret going in thinking about in terms of not only a table but also once you've got a table a side well, I think we all know at this point that Brett is just Trident dot faction at this point, yes, really, yes. isn't it? So what I'm looking for primarily, Tridents are fairly accurate pieces, but it can slowly start to slip away from you if there's too much, say, concealment, unless you've got um, an objective in a decent spot where you can just hand one the mile of sight, say, or a wall in an awkward place can be annoying. So I'm looking for a table where... I'm not seeing so much of that on either side. I'm normally fairly pessimistic when it comes to um, what I'll be given on any given table. I always assume I'll lose the roll off and I'll be given an unfavorable side or something, which is possibly not entirely correct. People tend to want to deny rep first turn. So sometimes you can look for tables and think there's one good side here and they're not going to want to give, say, Assyria first turn because of the way Assyria plays or to a lesser extent, Gareth 2, with the Threat Rangers, Gareth 2 can engineer. They're not going to want to always give first turn away. So sometimes you will get to pick side, but I tend not to want to risk it. I'm also looking for as much freedom of movement with Tridents and with other pieces as possible. So, for example, my Gareth 2 list plays triple Battle Engine, double Trident, and an AFG. So not only am I looking for a lot of freedom of movement with the Tridents being able to dart in and out, kite threat ranges, basically I'm looking for no buildings and no walls in the way. You're looking for a parking lot? Yeah, essentially. I'm also looking for somewhere the AFG can just sit, ideally close to the objective, whatever that may be, where it has... I'll never expect it to have full coverage of all of its range. I think that's unrealistic. But to be able to get, say, about half of its arc where it's just a free fire zone is an AFG's dream come true because it can just print money by sitting there. So that's what I'm looking for in terms of tables. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. And so I, I, my 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 team were doing the same thing. Uh, so me and Tomáš were on a team with Patrick and a uh, friend of mine from Slovenia, Dennis. Uh, as well as Daniel Lundström um, from Sweden. So we we were doing the same thing. We were looking to mainly pick tables. Um, did everyone that you played against, did they do the same thing? Were they also looking to pick tables or did, did anyone ever pick matchups? I also don't remember. Um, I don't think we won the roll on the entire weekend. Yeah, Jake's jinx kept going strong. Um, I don't think there was any point at which we won the roll and I think... Norway, I seem to recall picking tables. They did. Yeah. Swedes definitely picked tables. Yeah. Um, uh, the first game, the first team definitely picked tables. So it looks like everyone was picking tables all day. Every yeah, day. I, th I don't think we, I don't think we picked tables a single round. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Maybe, maybe um, the second round. Okay. All right. And um, a bit of an open question. Um, but I mean, you know, just to keep it in uh, organized format, we'll start with Ben. Um, what do you think is likely to happen with hills disappearing and WTC terrain being what it is, like sets? Um, I imagine the hills will either become rubble or get removed or get turned over and have acid bath written on the bottom. Sorry, oh, they won't, yeah. Ben, they won't be writing acid bath, they'll be writing spicy water. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Is this the same thing like the fire ants and spicy boys? No, I made some terrible paper terrain for Game of Marks, and I wrote things like ouch water and spicy cloud. Okay, nice, nice. Is that? I think I saw photos of that actually. Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> Thomas, have you heard anything that. from like uh, from any of the guys from the WCC committee or from anyone really about what the hell we're going to do about hills? Because like it does fuck a few factions over if 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 all hills become rubble, which is what like I found a lot of. Like tournaments have gone, mm, we've got some spare walls, we've got some spare buildings from fantasy, we've got some spare this, that, and the other, we'll just throw them in because there's no hills. It, it creates a lot more like active terrain, I want to say, um, which causes problems for stuff like Menoth, uh, Kate, well, in the past, Kador, and you know, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, I did not hear anything about it from anyone competent. 
but I know they are looking to hand out the event to someone else. Yeah. And I imagine they are not going to invest any more money into printing new terrain. So what they are probably going to do instead is just use the current hills as something else. Yeah. And the thing is that makes it maybe easier is that the current hills don't really look like hills. Yeah, true. They are rectangular and they can be anything. They can be a rubble, they can be an obstacle, obstruction, or whatever. So I think they are just going to give us instructions on what those pieces are. Interesting. I think a lot of us would be really interested to hear about that because, I mean, there's not much we can do about it at this point. I mean, list locks in four days, but uh, I think it will be impactful. Yeah, maybe they didn't hear the message. Like, maybe they don't know players are curious about it well in that case guys we're curious uh <laughs> st- st- get, let's get let's get a, uh, an announcement stop stop trying to sell off the wtc to someone and uh <laughs> if they were listening to us they would already answer that i think we are <laughs> chatting about it three episodes in a row so well we're chatting about it again fuckers <laughs> T- tell us what's going on <laughs> Right, um, so that is all the stuff about the uh, uh, the team tournament and the terrain. Da, 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 da. So, how about the tournament in general? Um, I particularly want to hear about your accommodation. I already know about it. I just want to hear you talk about it again because it's hilarious. So, first of all, where did you end up and how? Before Jake says anything, our accommodation was excellent. <laughs> Absolutely, 100% agree. Please ignore anything Jake says the contrary. So, I'll speak with a level head, uh, <laughs> like these two fucking nuggets. This is a lie, carry on. Um, so, our, our Airbnb we booked for, for Lund got cancelled four days before, before we flew. So, we had to find accommodation very, very quickly. Uh, and I, was, I think Mark found this lovely place called the, the Grand Circus Hotel. <laughs> uh, and I thought, oh, it's a circus-themed hotel. Like, okay, that's fine. It was pretty cheap. We'll go. We turn up in this industrial estate in a ropey part of Lund, um, down like a single track road. To what, what greet us, greets us when we get out of the Uber is um, caravans. They're not just caravans; they're handmade. They're handmade wooden circus-themed caravans. Yeah, they're like old-fashioned, like traveller caravans, like horse-drawn caravans. It was amazing. It still cracks me. It was on. not. Uh, so we slept. Well, there was a double bed. Um, so the the um, the caravan we were in, it was as wide as a double bed, and so me and Ben obviously we're, we're the biggest guys. We slept slept on the on the big double bed. Lying down, I could touch with my head on the pillow. I could touch the window at the opposite end of the caravan. Yeah, and then there was a pull out child's bed underneath the double bed, which was a pretty much just a box, and that was where Mark slept. All three of us next to each other, the width of the caravan. They it refused to have the windows open at night in case they got murdered. It was ridiculous. <laughs> I was I was genuinely scared we were going to get stabbed. <laughs> there's a there's an amazing photo of Jake just sitting in this caravan with his head in his hands, uh, and it just it made my day. It really did. It was when the uh, episode goes up, I will happily post it in the comments. For everyone <laughs> yeah. watching, it is like Renaissance art. I'm sure we could post some photos of our rooms. Of our room. Absolutely. Great. I'll make sure to post the, ben, the one of Ben navigating the balance beam to the toilet blocks. Yeah, the caravan swayed from side to side if you walked in it. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, an, an, an honest question. It's not. It's not like barbed or anything. But what made you choose not to stay at the hotel? Like it's. A, it's an American style convention. One of the. One of the selling points of those conventions is that you know people want to go and all stay in the hotel and wake up and have breakfast together and turn it into one big thing. What What turned you away? Was it solely the price, or what? What was it? I can answer that. So, as the one who booked it, we booked fairly late. Jake said earlier that he was sort of late on in being able to secure the time off for Lund. And also, we're lazy and not very good at this. So, we booked fairly late in the day. And by that point, there weren't any spaces left in the hotel. So, it was... You would have taken it if you could, even with the price difference. Yeah. It was less a matter of preference and more just that was what we had available. We physically, we physically couldn't book the hotel. We did try. Yeah. So, if you could, you would have. Yes, absolutely. We'd stayed there the previous year and had no issues. If the option had been available to stay in the hotel, I'm sure we would have taken it. Yep. And not in the crazy clown rape camp. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm happy to have had the experience. And I'm not. He's <laughs> lying. He was happy by the end. I find it difficult relieving. to take someone who says that they speak with a level head while their head looks like a pot noodle. Crazy clown rape camp is the name of my sex tape. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and if it's not, it should be. Right. Um, <laughs> moving on. Um, so we've already sort of done our thoughts on Lund. And I, uh, you know, in case you, our first episode ever was after the original Lund. And so far, all of us, that have, all we've ever done is tell everybody how great it is. And we could go on and do that again today. And I'm sure you would if I asked you. But instead, I'm going to go a different tack and ask you, what did you think could be improved? Like, we all love this convention. So let's go ahead and improve it. What? If you had to name something, and I'm going to force you, what would we improve? I'll jump on that grenade. Um, timings. This wasn't a major concern, but it was the only one I had. It got a little bit spicy towards the end. So I think the team tournament overran quite substantially. We were finishing it around, I want to say, 11, close to midnight, perhaps. It was late. It was very, very late. And what it, caused it, that? I'm when you not say timings, it's like... Sure. So you think that so was the not a schedule or they didn't stick to the schedule or people fucked about with this like what or is just a badly made schedule? What, what, when we say timings, what do we mean? A schedule was posted. I can't speak to how well it was made without looking at it, and I don't have it in front of me to hand. But as far as I could tell, a few rounds just slipped. Now that's a natural part of the pairing process, as we all know. It's fairly complex. People that aren't used to it can have to take a certain amount of time just to understand exactly what's going on. And of course that time will lessen as people get used to it, but it still sets things back a bit and it has to be done before the round can start. There was also the issue of tables. So the rows weren't laid out in rows of five. So a given team could be split over quite a large area of the room. That so was therefore, that annoying. Yeah, so when it comes to picking tables, as I'm sure you guys were aware, it became a matter of people sort of hopping back and forth. And when you've got like 80, 100 nerds in a room, all trying to navigate around with armies, tokens, all the things we carry around with us, it can be quite a feat to manoeuvre yourself back and forth to wherever your team's going and go, yeah, I'll have that table. That's a million miles over there. Let me now go on my little voyage and take all my stuff over there, hopefully in one trip, and then maybe I'll start playing War Machine. And that can, of course, set the event back quite a bit. Um, I think it really started to set in in the last round. We all popped over to the local sort of co-op deli place to get a bucket of salad. And by the time we were heading back, we are like, well, we we might not be able to risk just sitting and eating this and there was a sort of nearby park that we all wanted to pop down to because we may have needed to just be straight back at the venue going straight into the final round it just felt a bit rushed and it's not the kind the convention experience is supposed to be in my view about avoiding that you generally want to make sure that it's relaxed there's no massive stress everybody gets to eat it's a social event and the social aspect of it gets played up in that format but there's, an obvious, like, there's an obvious contrast between what you're saying because what you're saying is we want to have a casual no time stress we want to have it all you know spend our time get the social aspects and all the rest of it but that's what leads to the slippage that causes the timing issues that you're talking about um, so so I, I, sorry, I can i can butt in there so the start of i think it was the the start of the day was too casual, which meant the end of the day couldn't be casual enough. That sounds that's a really shit way of saying it, and I know it is. But I think the it's 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 when it's like the snowball effect. So like the first round, well if it overruns by half an hour, you start in everything later, so then your last round is rushed. So if there's a I structure, that's a shit way of explaining it, I understand that. Like that right, makes so sense. If, yeah. if the structure's put into place for the early round, the late one's not as rushed. Because we should have probably finished by ten o'clock at the latest. I think we got back to our um, clown house at nearly 1am in the 1am. I think it was a clown rape caravan. But just a- yeah, when the final round should have finished at like half nine. So I, I think a, a more rigid schedule would have been appreciated. But I think it was sort of okay. Like we're, we're, we're really trying hard to find uh, faults with it. That's always the case with these. Like, I mean, the, 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 again, to stress, we all think the tournament's amazing, but I just yeah. wanted to sort of, so that we're not just trumpeting that horn again. Um, yeah, we're, yeah, we're trying to find problems. I, I am. I think I only have one thing, but it's nothing to do with the tears. Um, um, the food at the hotel is shit. <laughs> it's just really bad. Any, anyone, like, anyone agree with that? No. I thought it was all right. Tomash, all you ate was potatoes for four days. <laughs> <laughs> I walked up to Tomash just standing at the potatoes, spooning them one at a time onto his plate and just turned and looked me dead in the eye and kept going. <laughs> <laughs> Without any change of facial expression. <laughs> like, I, it's, like, for me, I say, I like my food, but it was just a little bit crap. Like, only having one choice, 
Um, it all been very. Uh, I I get why that it's done. It's cheap, and if you you're feeding a hundred nerds into in an hour and a half, I get why you do it. But like, just give it a little bit of an extra something, just like a bit of a choice, not just like so. On what was it on the Saturday? This your option is fish. Or not yeah, fish. that was a bit of a fucker for me, considering I don't like fish. <laughs> yeah, like you have fish and potatoes. That's it. Like, just sling a massive bowl of, pas- of like pasta salad or something on there as well. Like, it doesn't take a lot, and maybe the ticket price goes up a fiver each. We don't really care. Just yeah. like maybe a little bit more on the food side would have been nice. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think those are like. I mean, that's that's exactly. I hope that the the organizer listening because I think that's the sort of thing that they'd, they'd love to hear, so they can pass it on and uh, and take it into the next year. Right. We are moving along, so we're going to get on to the next uh, section, which is um, teams like lists. What what factions were people taking? Um, what did you see a lot of? What were you expecting to see? Uh, what were you not expecting to see? Um, so let's start with Ben. Um, what did you see a lot of? Maybe more than you were expecting. Um, I don't think anything really jumped out to me. Okay. There was no Kador. That that caught me out. Okay, so you're going to answer the other question. Yeah, what did you not see much of, yeah? There was very little Kador that I remember. Do you think that's a UK perspective, or just a, just generally Kador are better than that, and there should have been some there? Kador are really good. They're, like, not top five, but they're probably next. Maybe even competing for fifth. I'm surprised no one's playing Kador. Fair enough. Um, Jake, what did you like expect to see and were they there? Um, so there was probably a lot more Kruger 2 than I anticipated. I sort of, I've, I'd forgotten a little bit about Circle. Then when we came in and there's like, there's wells everywhere. Like, was, was, there, was there 22 wells in the building or something? Did we count them? Something silly like yeah. that, I'm sure. And like a lot of Kruger 2, I'm like, oh yeah, shit, here's a war caster that's really good. You'll be all playing Zal 2 and then you just giggle a bit, don't you? Like, it's not that easy. Is it not? No. Um, I've played it a couple of times and it's kind of weird because Zal can just randomly die. Because <laughs> he has got pretty garbage stats when he's not on feet turn. Right, okay, so Zal can just pop. Fair yeah. Um, so, and also a, a bit of a lack of scorn, really. I think there was only three of us, maybe four of us. That was a blessing for me. Like, I can't, like, I, well, I can name the scorn players there and there was right. no one else that I think was playing scorn maybe one more so out of a field of what was it was it 88 total or something something along those lines sure 80 Having something scorn yeah. players is a bit low maybe there was yeah. a lot of signar there was quite there was quite a bit of signar there which, which was surprising i think maybe your hands like in championing signar a little bit in sweden and might have bumped the popularity a little bit or it might be nothing to do with it you never know but um mark any surprises anything you were expecting to see i was expecting a decent amount more Grimkin, honestly. I mean, best faction in the game, you expect to see a reasonable proportion of people playing it. Yep. It's not like there were no Grimkin players. There were decent numbers of it. It wasn't to the same extent Jake describes with an absence of scorn, but sure. it certainly wasn't as much as I'm expecting, although that may be the UK perspective. We would had our practice weekend recently as Team England, and I believe about half the players who turned up were Grimkin players. Yeah, we have something of an overrepresentation of Grimkin uh, at the local and the national level. Grimkin is fucking everywhere in the country at the moment. That's because it's far too good. But yes, actually, well, yeah. what, like what were your what were your expectations for the event, and did they meet them, or was something different? And and how how's your Grimkin uh, numbers in Poland looking? I mean, from Polish meta perspective, the the meta at Lund wasn't really surprising. It was very similar. There was I was surprised personally that there's very little scorn, but we have very little scorn here too, so it was kind of similar. Uh huh. And how's your kin numbers? I think they are not UKish numbers, but we have uh, quite a lot of Grimkin players. Fair, fair. Who was the hero that took Texas? Um, it was a dude I played. Lovely. In which case, we'll get to it in the rounds. Don't worry about it. We'll come back to him. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that he got a mention, because my God, yes. He was, in fact, a hero. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. We're moving on to the round by rounds. Yeah, we should probably start with pairings. So tell us about your pairings, guys. And maybe we'll start with you, Ben. I played um, Dreamer in the, what well, I guess is the currently accepted build, which is Four Clocks, a Skinner a Cage Rager, Carry On a Rose. I don't think that DJ Froggy Fresh does anything for Dreamer, so I brought a Gorehound instead. Okay. And, and I played... Uh, yeah, of course. Yep. And I played King Bump, which is um, 
King, Four Clocks, Max Minde Slayers, because I really like Murder Crows. Um, a Madcap, a Grave Ghoul, Lord Longfellow, a Trapakin, the Frog, and Enoch Murder Crows. All right. Uh, Jake? Uh, so my pairing was uh, Zal 2 uh, in Exalted and Makeda 3 in DOA. Uh, Zal 2's uh, got a mammoth and the usual uh, Supreme Guardian, uh, some boys, some solos, all the usual good shit. Uh, then Makeda 3's got a uh, Molik, four brutes, uh, a turtle, Kraya, Agonizer, Gladiator, all the usual support stuff. And that's it, really. No minions. Why? Because uh, they're terrible. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, no, it's um, the minions really make it hard. The minion war beasts make it hard. Like the points make the list weird. So until the um, the riot quest terrorizer comes out, because um, he's rumored has got rush as an animus, um, you have to take a gladiator, and that is just a fifteen point. 15 points just like almost wasted on support. So you. Tax. Yeah, tax. So you can't really get everything you want. You can only sort of go half assed at it. When the Terrorizer comes out, you'll be seeing a lot of Makeda 3 with the minions. A lot. All right. So would you say that Legion should get a baby Seraph so they can stop complaining about paying tax for Seraph? No, Le- Legion don't get nice things. Scorn get nice things. We're, we're like, we've been an <laughs> oppressed people for so long. Well, I would allow all the broken stuff now. I want to slap you. We will. <laughs> I do. Stop saying we. You. Swear. Yeah. When did you start scoring, Jake? <laughs> I started when they became broken. As the only person in here who played pre errata scorn, I echo Jake's sentiments, but they may have pushed that lever a little bit too far now. No, they're fine. They're fine. <laughs> yeah. They're, everything's fine. Yeah. They're fine. <sighs> yeah. Right. Mark, tell us about your pairing. Early standard, Gareth 2 in Defenders, triple Hoppy Moros, triple Battle Engine as previously described, a load of support, Electromancers and the Rifle Team. Unfortunately, uh, Battle Atland did not allow people to take the Hermit, which meant I had to swap him out for some garbage model called Iris 1. Uh, she doesn't really do anything and did not do anything for the entire tournament. Then the other list was Assyria in Forges of War, which is a fairly non-standard build at the moment, but I'm very happy with it. Ben made it for me quite recently. It's still double trident because this is Retribution, of course, but it contains such delights as Discordia, because Armour 22 tridents are such fun, Nis Hunters of all things, thank you Polish, for putting me onto that tech, and a Marshalled Griffin, which is just the hero of every single game it participates in. Absolutely brilliant model is the Marshalled Griffin. It's just silly. And it's a terrible list and no one should play it. Oh, absolutely. Right. I mean, definitely do not copy me. I know nothing about what I'm doing. No, no, he's dreadful. Just uh, just leave that one be. We're right. not being sarcastic, by the way. That's actually true. I am dreadful. <laughs> Both as a person and at War Machine. Yes. All right. What about the Danes? Oh, um, I can cover for Casper because it's really easy. He was playing Ron. It had two tridents, an amount of arc nodes, and some battle mages and other things. There you go. His list done. Ben, what was Mikkel playing? We wrote Mikkel's list on the morning of the tournament. He was playing a child list that looked a lot like my Dreamer list. I can't remember exactly what was in it, but it was pretty. It was pretty much the same list, I think. With Nell. Yes. And a witch list that looked a lot like my King of Nothing list, except I don't think it had Murder Crows, and I don't know if he played it at all. I don't believe he did. Um, Grim Grimkin, this building is in a pretty static place, in my opinion, especially with regards to the Bump in the Night list, because that theme kind of writes itself. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, so we enter the round by rounds, um, and we're going to, due to sort of time constraints and so on, we are going to flick through rounds one and two fairly quickly. I went through with the, guy, with the guys before the episode um, on like which uh, rounds wanted to spend a bit more time talking about, and as much as they would love to talk about uh, each game uh, in detail, we're going to have to just uh, focus in on round three and four just for, for time reasons. So give us a, um, a very quick roundup of round one. You were playing against the Swedish local team, I believe. Yes, we were. Um... It was it was a mixture of players. So there was um, was it Oscar, one of their WTC players, were on there. Oscar Sibek. Yes. Um, so he was on there. Um, the TO was on there, and there was just a bit of a mismatch of, of players. I, don't, I think they were all local from from Sweden. Um, so yeah, we we did we got them got them round one. 
Okay, and if I understand it correctly, Mark's going to help me out keeping things moving by getting a buy in the first round, is that right? That is indeed correct. I did get a buy and sort of wandered around for two hours. Move on. <laughs> Marvellous. Mark's, Mark's best deserved win of the tournament. Right, so... <laughs> Jake, I believe this is the moment we get to discuss the hero of the hour. The man, the myth, the legend. So, I, I play against Texas. Uh, I've never, never played against <laughs> Texas. He's, a, he's quite an interesting broadcaster. But when you have Zal 2 and none of his kit actually does anything, it, he's pretty sad. He turns out he's just got some drudges and they have some appalling stats. <laughs> They're really, really <laughs> bad models. How many models You're sitting there with 30 Jake? immortals and he's got, what, 60 drudges? 60 drudges. Uh, I lost, I think, four models the entire game. It was pretty sad. I, my like, Zal's feet, he actually can't do anything to me on Zal's feet. And then when you run a Mammoth and a Supreme directly at his face in on in the middle zone on uh, Invasion, there's not a lot he can do with it, really. I felt pretty sad <laughs> for the guy. Um, he felt like he got busted a little bit. Um, but it's just one of those things like Zal was just, he's just going to roll over it all. It was a shame, really. It was a, it was a nice chap. <laughs> it's a shame, really. He was a nice chap. That's that's kind of a bit of a theme with your games. <laughs> it's like ah, it's a bit of a shame, really. Nice chap, Zal too, you know. And next, um, Ben, who did you have in the first round? Uh, I played against Johan, who was one of the TOs. Um, he had okay. Abby, one Children of the Dragon, and some other Legion list that I honestly don't remember. Um, okay. We played Dreamer Abby one. I got a pretty solid table. His list doesn't re- doesn't really have anything it can do against mine. Like he's got, and is that just because the character beasts of Legion don't do anything into clocks? They just, they just. Get I mean, out of like value, the, the, they're fine. They'll hit some clocks. Zuriel's got precision strike, which is neat. But ultimately, he has like two and a half heavies and some raptors, and I have six heavies. Yeah, and a better yeah. caster. So I just kind of, I just kind of dodge all my bullshit at him, and eventually he loses. That's that sounds about right. Um, and I've no love for Abby one. So um, and with that, we move past round one. Lovely, speeding along. Um, round two, I believe you had like it was you were trying to describe it to me. I think it was like a Norway WTC ish team from last year that might not necessarily all be on the team this year, but that that kind of level of player, solid Norwegian players. Norway three and a half. Norway three and a half. Yeah, all right. Norway three and a half. So. Um, Norway three and a half, round two. Mark, who was your opponent? I played against, I believe his name was Kenneth, playing Coven. Matchup was Coven Gareth two. As an ex- ex-Crix player, or possibly a current Crix player in your heart, um, what did you think of his Coven list? Once a Crix player, always a Crix player, Simon. But I very much liked this list. Um, single node, which was a bit... Ooh, I couldn't tell you the exact list, by the way. It's accessible on Conflict sure, Chamber sure, if anyone's no, interested. We're not looking for those. It's yeah. built around three sort of modules. Unit Raiders, Cryptus on Iacos, and a Kraken. And okay. it's just... It's a lot of threat vectors. It's a lot of very fast stuff. And Coven's feet protects it all. It's just a good and list. And how does that play into Gareth 2, then? How did that work out? Well, it worked out well for him in the end. Um... I got first turn, ran everything at him. He respected my threat ranges, um, feated on the bottom of one, otherwise his army explodes. And unfortunately, it turns out Moros does things. So the thing that Moros did in this instance was killed one of the Coven Witches on his feet turn by a combination of a Trident Place, a Road to War move, Fleet, and just walking into melee with her. Um, so she died, and suddenly that 18-inch feet bubble became 12 inches. So a Kraken blew up, um, a unit Raiders blew up, an Arknode blew up, and something else blew up. Gerlach blew up. Um, that was quite nice. Moros decided he wasn't quite finished making attacks after killing this witch, and just casually one-shot Gerlach, as one does. So that's that's a rough coven feet turn. Absolutely. <laughs> it's generally not what one would expect to happen on their feet turn. Unfortunately, I'm so used to playing Gareth with Hermit that I made a focus allocation decision that I probably shouldn't have and ended up with a passable assassination run. I think it was a hair under 50-50. Um, but right. we were having... So- so Kenneth hadn't played into Rhett very much before, so we were playing quite a relaxed game. I was explaining what stuff did, and it got to the point where he's like, well, I've got to go for this assassination run. And we've been getting on well, so it's just, yeah, roll these dice out one at a time. Let's see what this, this happens. Charybdis tramples to get one attack on Gareth. 
He tramples into a trident's melee range, so he gets slammed. He does not get slammed far enough that I don't have melee range. Uh, sorry, that he loses melee range to Gareth anymore. Problem okay. one. Problem two. Buys an attack after trample boosts the roll to hit. First dice is a one. I'm thinking, right, this is excellent. Second dice is a four. Doesn't Charybdis just get knocked down by the slam? Charybdis is steady, my friend. Mother f- all of the um, All of that chassis is... Indeed. Bastards. But yeah. First a one, <laughs> right, then a four. On. I get my hopes up, then I see the five, and I'm like, oh fuck, okay. And then on the damage roll, starts with a one. I'm like, okay, this is where I get bailed out. And then it's a six, so I die. It was a bit sad. But we end up just dry heave laughing for ten minutes afterwards. It was an absolutely brilliant game and a pleasure to play him, so I can't be too mad. I heard that game from across the room. I'm sure you did. I mean, any game involving me can be heard from across the room, especially if it involves a judge call. It was at that time, so exactly at the time when he was trying to assassinate you, I was trying to assassinate the semi-final of the Masters. Uh, sorry, the finalist of the Masters, the second place guy. Uh, Lars. Lars. Um, I was trying to kill his McKay at the same time. And while you rolled every dice one at a time, um, I rolled, I basically got Gederix onto McKay, but four attacks and um and i i asked him if he wouldn't mind if i rolled all the hit rolls one at a time first so i rolled them i hit every attack and then we worked out that it was straight dice damage so what we could have actually done and we're so disappointed in ourselves that we didn't notice is that i could have taken all of the damage die together and rolled them all at once (laughs) to see whether we killed him the one opportunity to be a 40k player Yes, I could have got to roll a bucket of dice, and I, I, I just didn't. So that was massively disappointing. Anyway, right, that was your round two game, um, and it ended up with Gareth dying to a Charybdis one shot. Not one shot. There was some other chip involved from Savara, but okay. pretty much the majority okay. of it done by Charybdis, yes. Right, okay, he reached out and touched you. Fair enough. Jake, what was your round two? Uh, round two, uh, I can't remember the, the name of the guy. He's one of my, one of my smoking buddies from, from Norway. Um, we always seem to be outside having a, having a cigarette after, after our rounds. Can't remember his bloody <laughs> name, though. Uh, so we played the, uh, the Zal 2 Mirror, that, that, fun, right. that fun game. Uh, he had a slightly different list to mine. Uh, he was running Double Supreme, but then he had a, a shit battle group. He had Kraya, no, Shaman, Shaman, Kraya, Bronzeback, something. Which I, I'm not a Did huge fan of that, that battle back? group. Uh, whereas I'm running the Mammoth. He does yeah, but didn't you used to run that? Yeah, didn't you run that exact battle group, man? Yeah, and it's shit. That's why I don't use it anymore. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I saw the error in my ways, and more huge bases is more better. Um, right. So he's running two Supremes. I'm only running one. So, but I, I do have the Mammoth, so I can start doing early game work onto him, so I can pick out his solos. I can start shooting the Supremes, because... Without the feet, feet turn, they actually are a little bit squishy. They're only armor 19. And when your mammoth's power 15 boosted, you can actually do some serious damage with them early on. Um, so I get it quite interesting. But we both sort of knew um, who should... Uh, it, was on, it was on Recon 2 again. Um, and we both sort of knew how the game went out about like feet in second um, and trying to like, take the um, vengeance bait and how much to give before your feet... So we spent about an hour and a half dancing around each other um, before actually committing. And he sort of came into me and, and feated. And I did, I did nothing to him. I didn't trigger vengeance. I didn't kill anything. I, I used the mammoth to, like, to shoot, um, to shoot to like novitiates and things like that and try not to trigger much vengeance. I did, unfortunately, scatter a supreme shot, which I went to set things on fire. And to kill a boy, I need like a 12 to kill him, or 11 to kill him on blast damage or something. And I killed him, trigger vengeance, which was a bit annoying. Um, That's sad. Uh, but then the following turn, I feated and I took a big scenario lead. Uh, like I, I cleared a zone, scored my flag, killed the objective, and feated on him. So I thought I was in a pretty good place. Um, but then his Supreme rolled like absolute fire and killed my feet on Supreme. Oh, okay. It shouldn't happen. That should not happen. Right. He was dice off. You, did you did you check it out? Was that was was it dice off? Um, so he couldn't hammer boy because I killed it already. So he couldn't give it the plus two. Um, so he's dice off six. But he's a weapon master. Okay, so he's doing dice off six, fourteen, no eleven. 
So he's doing five points a hit, four hits. Yeah. 20 boxes on average, and he and he needed how many to kill the Supreme? Have they got 30 something? Uh, 33. Right. Was this charging, Jake, to be clear? Not charging, no, because I want to engage him. Not charging. That'll be an 8.9% according to the beep boop. Didn't you vision the charge attack? No, vision was somewhere else, I think. Was vision there? I thought that he charged and you visioned it. Yes, maybe. Yeah, actually, yeah. So, uh, so it's only three attacks, sorry. Woof. 0. <laughs> 0.06. <Jesus>. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing seven and a half. Oh no, I've done it wrong. Ignore me. Yeah, yeah. So that was, that was a bit annoying losing that. But he committed so much, and I'd already done so much attrition work that the next turn I basically cleaned up and was winning on scenario because he couldn't get physically get to my flag to contest. Because the thing is, like, okay. with Zal, like Zal two can normally always contest, but every model in my army is magical, so he can never get the model there. Right, he can't incorporate. Can't get through. Yeah, uh, I killed his supreme. That's near my flag. And anything he puts near my flag I, it gets counterblasted from the mammoth normally. Oh, if he just tries to get one thing through. Yeah, yeah. if you get one thing through, I just counterblast it to death. But yeah, so it was a good game. Uh, I managed to managed to win it just on the on scenario. On scenario. All right, fair enough. And Ben, uh, I had Makeda three. Um, his list was a bit weird. It was double turtle, double brute, double archidon, and a gladiator on um, what's his chops. And I think that was it. it there, were, there weren't a lot of models. Um, and that's why you're saying it's weird. Yeah, there was just not a lot there. There was no Moloch. There was no real heavy other than the Gladiator. And and how did that play out? Like, I mean, first of all, I'm going to assume that you took uh, Dreamer again. Good lord, I need a new headset. Uh, yeah, I play Dreamer. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I, I sensed that there might have been a headset image, so I was just trying to fill the gap while you got it back on. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I, if, if it's an actual issue, I can probably find a different one. Ah, I think we're doing all right. So, um, so how you know you felt like his last uh, list was a bit lacking in heavies against Grimkin. That's usually not a great thing because it's number of heavies versus number of heavies. I had a pretty solid table for it as well. There was a big, a big building in the middle, which meant that I could basically kite the turtles for as long as I needed to, if it was, actually came down to it. And you mentioned there might have been a little trick that you pulled off at some point. What was that? Uh, so, um, he had a pair of Archidons anchoring the back end of my zone, the right-hand zone on Recon 2, base to base on a bulwark in a forest, which is, like, annoying to deal with. So I um, I pushed a crab it up into the zone, into threat range of an Archidon, figuring that this was, like, a cheap bait. It probably wouldn't work, but I'd be really happy if it did. And then without measuring at all, I just shoved the Cage Rager up behind it, didn't bother to check Arcane Vortex range and tried to eyeball it. And then when he came in to kill it, I got to Arcane Vortex's print, which was fun. Oh... Oh, that's a bit dirty. It was pretty neat. I like did. I, um, if I'd done it right, I would have left the crab. It as the only thing contesting my zone and given him the points in exchange for picking up the Arcadon, which is fine. But I genuinely right. it didn't occur to me until after I'd moved a Gremlin Swarm into the zone as well. Okay. It, okay. It was just like a cheap bait, and I figured it cost me nothing, and I might get to pick up an Arcadon for no reason. But it's one of those where you you, you can't measure it, but yeah. you really want to. As soon as you check the <laughs> vortex range in your turn, he knows what the jig is, and it just isn't happening. So you've just got to shove that yeah. cage rager and hope that you can eyeball three inches properly. And I'm pretty good at eyeballing <laughs> three inches. I'm kind of used to that measurement by now. So every time you take a piss, right? Yeah, precisely, precisely. Yeah. All right. So um, we move into round three, which I think was against uh, Norway one. So that's Sverre's team. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it was Sverre, Martin, one Christian, and. A mystery fifth person. Uh, I should remember. It was Kuba. Yeah, it was Kuba. Kuba thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Could not remember. Man, the myth of legend. <laughs> um, and oh Christ, I should have said. Um, like, as far as I'm aware, Mikel and Casper um, uh, were just being heroes of the hour during the uh, during the the team as well. Oh, right? uh, Mikel, Mikel was two and zero. Oh. He won both his games, and Casper had lost both his games. Oh, he'd failed to run people. Yeah, Casper, Casper, Casper was zero and two. Mikel was two and zero. Oh. Also worth and noting... He, was, was Casper getting bust a little bit, or was he just failing to round people? Um, a mixture of both, I think. Okay, all right. Uh, so, I didn't want to forget them. Uh, they're not here with us today, not out of any sort of prejudice, but just because it's much easier for me to get hold of the England Knights, fellas. And also, if we have five people, then this will take forever. Um, so, this seemed like a, an easy way to do it. But uh, apologies that we didn't get you on, guys. It's uh, if, you, if you're listening, it would have been a pleasure, but uh, just scheduling doesn't allow it. All right, so, round, Norway won round... Well, I mean, sorry, Norway won. Norway, one of the teams will pretend that they're not Norway won. Um, round three... And Mark, who was your opponent? So I played against uh, Kuba um, due to a little bit of last minute matchup uh, jiggery pokery. Uh, we end up playing Harbinger Gareth. 
In- okay. Interesting game. Went right down to the wire. Um, could really have used the Hermit in that game, but unfortunately did not have one. And it came down to Moros failing what was, I think, about 60% or something on Harbinger, top of turn seven. Real drag out, knockdown scenario fight, but the assassination was the only out for me in the end. It didn't go off. But an interesting game okay. against a lovely opponent with a shrine because. The one thing that Harbinger needed more than anything was recurring initiates. <laughs> Do you think that tech is spicy or just janky? I think it's designed for certain things. I don't think it was designed for the matchup that we were playing. I can understand why he chose to take it. Fair enough. And do you feel that Gareth is the is the only choice into Harbinger or just the correct choice, given your pairing? I'm aware that there's conflicting opinions on this. I would say that anything outside of Gareth 2 into Harbinger is absolutely unplayable and that um, some of the alternatives out there have been... I've heard a few propositions. There's one that I probably need to test at some point, which is Virus 2. Um, I've okay. heard good things about that. But um, in the context of my pairing, certainly Gareth 2 was the correct decision. And it's not a great game, but I get to practice it a lot. So I was hoping to leverage that. Didn't pan out. C'est la vie. All right. I heard Calandra is the answer. Yes, Calandra is absolutely the answer. Um, Don't know how (laughs) Harbinger beats that. I mean, Trolls, known to be very, very difficult matchup for Protectorate. It's the one thing that's holding them back as a faction, really, is they can't play trolls. <laughs> um, Sorry, it just it may have no. got a bit too real there. <laughs> <laughs> There's some tears just slowly trickling down listeners' cheeks. Apologies now. to it, like... nobody in particular who was offended by that. <laughs> All right, Jake, you um, got, I believe it was Sfera in round three, was it? Yeah, so I, put, I got Sfera. So in the matchup process, me and Mark were the last two. And we were picking the last two matchup. So there was Sfera with a slightly different Gareth list than what Mark was running. He only had one Trident in the list, uh, but he had a, a one of the heavies. I don't know which one it is. Um, one of the the eighteen point one, whichever one it is. And then there was is that a Banshee or something? Mark, do you remember the Banshee? Banshee. Um, so me and Mark were chatting about which what which is uh, which were the most sensible thing to do. Uh, I said, I've got most practice into Gareth because me and Mark play all the time. And Mark was theorying Harbinger, see if it is playable. So what we went for was the, I think the most sensible option was to give me um, Gareth and let let Mark play Harbinger. Uh, Bad news. Do you still think that was correct after the fact? After the fact, of course, yeah, it was 100% correct. If we'd have lost it, then obviously it wouldn't have been correct. (laughs) <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, the scenario was, was spread the net, and this is this was a really really good scenario for for Zal in this sense. Um, there was a really nice building uh, which was covering the co- the the circle corner of my square zone. Does that make sense? Uh, just give me one second. Spread the net, circle corner of the square. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, and it it spread about six inches like diagonally, so it only covered a, co- a tiny bit of my base. But I could put a huge base at either side of it and have the agonizer in the middle and cover the entirety of the two huge bases. With a basically terrain-covered agonizer. Yeah. So that's where an agonizer, Zal, and Abaddon, the shield guard, sat the entire game. <laughs> um, and I sort of replayed Just it. camping out. Pardon? Just camping yeah. out. And we started to play... We started to dance around each other and play the grind. Um... I got a bit lucky. I managed to kill uh, the Pain Knight, is it Scarathician, with like a no couple clue. of boosted spells and an eye laser off uh, off a poop holder. And I probably shouldn't have killed him. It's like it's quite a low percentage to kill him, but that meant I scored. He was stopping me scoring too. Was Scarath? Um, right. I don't know what you just said. So the chances of anyone else knowing are slim. What the fuck is a poop holder? <laughs> the Extola Soul Ward is notorious for literally holding a turd on the sculpt. If you look at that model, okay. it is... I mean, if your shits look like that, see a doctor, don't get me wrong. But it's close enough to a turd that it's known as the poop holder. It's the really Out of Sight guy. 
Have you really never heard the Exalted Soul Award called a poop holder? No. Wow. You gotta remember, I live in Central Europe. There's quite, it's there's not so much like British slang. Just slap about. a few accents on it. It'll be the same words, just with that. <laughs> put like eight. I mean, put I, like eight Z's in it, and you'll be fine. <laughs> I do my best to, you know, spread the British word around, but even so, like, right, okay, so, um, so uh, back on track. Randomly, he's got a boostable uh, power seven gun, which adds your strength to the power of the gun. So, into like Scarath, it's like a boostable power seven, 16 or something stupid. Okay. Just, 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 just randomly, because he's a, he's a three-point support solo who needed a boostable gun. Um, nice, and Zal, nice. so that meant I scored two against him. He scored none, and then Zal feated. So I've I've got something contesting it. I've got something contesting his uh, flag. I've got one member of each unit contesting his zone. So if he wants to clear his zone, he has to trigger vengeance. Um, and then we sort of just started the grind from there. But because I'd started a, uh, I had a good um, a good scenario uh, element, and I, how I could def- com- com- very comfortably defend my side. Um, with, with, due to that building, it so the scenario didn't get away from him. But I, at, at the end of turn seven, I was I was up on scenario. But we had a fantastic game, and so it was really nice, really, um, really quite a tactical game. Like any little mistake would cost us the would would cost each other it. Um, but right. I, I did manage to, to sneak it out on on scenario. Fair enough, fair enough. I know that. I mean, it's a little bit out of context, but we're not. We're probably not going to get to talk about the Sunday in in any other episode. So I know that you then went on and replayed that in the tournament I organised. Yeah, I lost. Um, and he managed to take it. So I mean, like it, it was clearly like it was that close, wasn't it? Like the fact that if, in in any given game it could go either way. Yeah, I say that the match will be pretty even, but as soon as the scenario gets anywhere near live, it favours all. So we played it on okay. the Sunday, but we played it on Invasion, and that's pretty much Zal's worst scenario. Right, okay. Invasion and Anarchy are his two worst scenarios. He, he hates both of them. Anything else, Fair. it's good for Zal. Right, right, okay, cool. Um, ben, you mentioned that you had the mirror. Do you remember who it was? Yeah, it was against uh, one. Uh, okay, cool. Right. Yeah, I played against him in another round. Nice, nice. All right, and how did that go? Or how does that play out? What, what, are, your, what are your thoughts? Um... So for like for the team tournament in general, I was trying to offer myself into every Grimkin mirror that I could, because Grimkin are broken. But I've played a decent number of mirrors because I live in England, and everyone has a Grimkin army. Sure. Um. So he had. And what are your thoughts on the mirror? Like, what, what do you think as you're going in there? You're looking at his pairing, and are you already sort of saying, "No, he's fucked up. He's not got the right Grimkin so mirror." He, uh, you know, answer. He had um the same dreamer list as me, I think, and a child list with um. Six clockatrices, and a child list with six clockatrices that we'd written. Me and Golly wrote um, about a month previously as a theorized list that was going to be really good into every Dark Menagerie mirror. Um, we'd had our England practice weekend, I think, the weekend before, and um, played a bunch of mirrors, including a couple of theor- a couple of like tests of bump into Dark Menagerie, which felt kind of passable. So, looking at his lists going in, I felt like if I played Dreamer. He would almost certainly give me a child and I would lose. Um, and this was kind of borne out by the table that we had. It was spread the net and there were two huge buildings on either side of the middle zone that in that matchup okay. would kind of act like a funnel. Um, I also felt like this was playing... This was a decent table and scenario to try and play bump into Dark Menagerie on. Because it was a wide scenario. The table that we had was actually pretty awkward to move a death another round if you played Dreamer. It was going to be pretty inconvenient to get clocks into the right places to stop me having like Malady men dropping monkeys to contest every zone. It's going to be pretty hard for him to get stuff on my flag once he was out of gremlin swarms. So going into that, I felt like I could play king into child, and as long as I didn't get my caster absolutely murdered, I could probably win on scenario. Okay. Um, he plays child, I play king. I'm pretty sure that I go first. I generally can't remember who went first. It doesn't matter a huge amount. Um, sure. We both run up. I set up a defensive position where I've got one clock anchoring the middle zone, clouded off so we can't force hammer it out, even though we can get his clocks through. I have one clock anchoring his flag, a uh, monkey contesting his zone, and I'm set up to score two, uh, which means I'm... He couldn't, run a, he couldn't run a cage rager? Uh, it, wasn't, into the cloud? it wasn't close enough. Like Even with okay. abuse, the cage rager only runs 12, and at that point he's basically trading his cage rager for that CP. Yeah, sure. Um, and also, more importantly, it means that the frog is casting abuse, which means the frog isn't parlaying, which affects how in danger child is. 
to like Fair getting enough. random and a couple of naysayers are projecting the zone. So like he comes in, he throws the clock out the middle zone, he throws the clock off his flag, he positions somewhat aggressively and scores two, and then my decide my dice decide that I'm absolutely winning the game. And I am um, <laughs> going in. I at the start on my turn, I think that end of all my activations, I kill two clocks conservatively. I expect to kill three, and I think there's a small chance I kill four. The way my turn goes, I've killed four clocks before I've activated my second two clockatrices. So, like, everything <laughs> worked. Like, naysayers would go into a clock, I'd do five damage, six damage, and the last guy would do 17 and just kill it without stuttering it. I sent a, um, right. a scything touch clock in, and that clock on its own one rounded one of one's clockatrices without proccing a single stutter or missing a single attack. Just like I think you just, are sing you are single handedly responsible just, just like, for the amount of stutters he got in my game with him. Just like everything like, worked. I think I triggered one meaningful stutter all turn, and then the other stutter I triggered, I triggered on a clock that was absolutely blocked in by my by, by my ambush. Right, so your karma came back and bit me in the ass because when I played against him, every clock stuttered at least twice. <laughs> like Yeah, I <laughs> it was I, I felt like even if I only killed three, that he'd retaliate and kill like a bunch of naysayers and some stuff, and I'd still have enough heavies left to probably see the game out, provided I could keep my caster alive. Um, and how hard is it to keep your caster alive? Um, his clocks go a long way, and the King of Nothing is 14-14, so it's kind of alarming. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that was sort of my thought. The turn, the turn I did that, I camped quite a lot, and I planned on having one clock that wasn't doing anything, and I ended up having two clocks that weren't doing anything, and I was camping about four, which is a threshold through which he can't spray me to death. Um, okay. Okay. The turn after that, I, from the center of the board on spread the net, I ran a model as far, like basically 21 inches away from my caster, directly to the left, towards the table edge, and Sansa faded into the middle of nowhere, so that I didn't die while I was right. wrapping up. And he had half an assassination that would basically require him to kill me with a single spray, which did which okay. didn't work. And did he go for it? Yeah, he needed okay. to. He needed to charge the child into a clockatrice, either kill it or um, crit pitch it out of my control. So I had no transfer target, and then killed me with his last remaining spray. Uh -huh. And it did not go well. That's off. a neat little play. Yeah, it wasn't bad. Um, my theory about the matchup was right, was that if I can stay alive, I think that childless, despite how it feels good in... ...is, um, is probably going to struggle into bump because it's a mass 6 army against a death 13 army, and... Nayslayers are good at killing clocks, even though clocks are also good at killing Nayslayers. Uh-huh. Okay, so not like a meta-breaking mirror discovery, but no, good to know. No, looking at, looking at the list, um, Syndra actually happened onto something really interesting for the Grimkin Mirror, which is if you just play Child and Bump, you can just have Ambush on your on top of your pile of Clockatrices, and that might just be really good into every mirror. Like, um, Sorry, say that again. So Syndra Colvang was playing um, Child Bump, so he basically had five or six clocks, I don't remember exactly, and then double murder crows and melody men, so he just has a big ambush threat. And that really curtails the way that naysayers need to play in that matchup, because they need to be able to spread wide to avoid getting sprayed to death. Um, huh. But when you have... That's kind of cool. Yeah, it's a really neat list. I really like it. Um, I've been thinking about it, because I submitted it as my third list of Blood and Oil. I've been thinking about it a lot like this week. I think, I think it might be possibly... If you're going to bring one list that you think has to play everything in Grimkin, I think that might be the one, because it seems good into most stuff. Even if only having, I think, five heavies in the version I submitted might mean it's slightly sad into some Dark Menagerie builds. It feels like a child hmm. list that's still sold into DM and can, can handle bump fine. Oh, fair enough. Well, that's interesting. Alternatively, you just play Dreamer and rely on being able to skill the child, which you sometimes can do, because you're a Dreamer. <laughs> and how, so how did the game end? What was the actual victory condition? Uh, I think he conceded and I didn't die. Okay, uh, so the, the last ditch the, assassination. The child was flapping in the wind, so I would have killed him. Um, oh, okay. I could have paralyzed the child. I would have been able to yeet a couple nice layers in, get a second clock into melee. Um, he was short of transfer targets, I think. Um, alternatively, okay. I could okay. probably have won on scenario because I think I was like one up and he was out of things to score his flag with. So. Right, it was a last ditch thing. Yeah, oh, cool. he also found a really neat play where um, when you pop out a casket from a madcap, it's steady because it's stumbling drunk. But he tried to find a throw line where he could throw a clock on top of it, least disturbance it out of stumbling drunk range. So, uh huh. And did that work or? Sorry, where did I cut off? Um, I, I was asking whether it worked, whether he's, he's stumbling uh, drunk, but he tried to throw something into the stumbling uh, it drunk. It worked. He um he got me out of stumbling drunk, but the judge ruled least disturbance, took took the car skimp away from the malady man he was trying to kill. 
Like, if, he, oh, if he'd killed okay. it, it would have been an absolutely huge swing for the scenario on that side of the board, because I needed that Malady Man to drip feed monkeys into his zone. Oh, that's pretty it was, it was a really play, neat though, play, and it occurred to me after that that um, the fact that cast Gimps are stumbling drunk when they're near the Madcap means that if you do manage to hit one and not kill it, it might just stumble back into the Madcap and explode, which is quite funny. <laughs> Fair enough. That's, yeah. But the thing is that you notice this kind of thing because, like, what was it you did against me in that game on Sunday? You genuinely let me spell sling your my, oh my that Cassius. was such a bad play but i found it hysterical um i let i let simon stranglehold my madcap to death turn one because i wanted to see if i could auto win the game by um catastrophic explosion in cassius to death and and not he actually got quite close <laughs> the dice nearly said yes i was like half an inch off and it would have done like three or four damage and set cassius on fire and if he'd burned to death i think i might just have won without having to play a war machine at all that game it would have been really funny but yeah, it's when you have these sort of ideas that I wonder, like, what the fuck's going on? Anyway, all right. So we've managed to get through rounds one, two, and three in reasonable pace, which means we can slow down a tiny bit um, and talk about round four in a bit more detail. So who were we playing against in round four? We were playing against Sweden, beep, boop, yeah. How have you been practicing that accent with your mic muted for the last 20 minutes while I've been talking about Grimke? It's entirely possible that that may or may not have been happening. I will not confirm or deny this. <laughs> Yeah, we were playing Sweden with Beep Boop. Was he doing it? It's my favourite night scene. <laughs> we were playing against a Beep Boop Sweden. Beep Boop Sweden. So yep. to clarify, oh, the okay. reason why the Sweden Beep Boop is Daniel Bergstrom has wrote them an amazing looking programme, very flashy, um, to do their matchup process for them. So basically what happens is they feed in a bunch of percentages, all of which are wrong, and the pairing machine tells them to do things that they then do, and then they lose every single game. So, uh, in, in a less toxic fashion, they feed into the machine what they think their win percentage is in each matchup, and then every time you um, you give them a like a choice to make in the matchup process, the machine crunches some numbers and comes back with what it thinks is the most likely, like the best percentage chance of winning the round. Yeah, I'm criticising yeah. this programme, but I immediately offered to buy it as soon as um, I saw it. And had to so be I saw it. Totally I saw it the night before, because um, Daniel was staying at the same place. He was staying with Johan, same as me. And I was so impressed with the simplicity and the the usability of the interface, combined with the just solid idea. But there is this core core principle of the thing which is that those numbers you give it have to be correct. There's, um, there's something else as well, which kind of touched on what actually happened in this round, which is that at the level, at that level, basically everything from 47 to 53 is a skill game. Like that, that, that big band in the middle, you're just saying, am I better than my opponent? If I am, I'll win. If I'm not, I'll lose. Yeah. And like yeah. They're, they're playing this program for marginal gains in the region of, well, we're taking this skill game instead of this one. And ultimately, it still mostly comes down to if you're best than your opponents. And it, yeah, it, it doesn't take into account player skill at all. It just takes matchups and that player's uh, confidence into that matchup Actually, and that sort of thing. It doesn't equate for human error either. So if so, if I would say say someone's put their matchup in, it's like, oh, this is a hundred percent fantastic game for me. But yet they've only they've only played like the four players around them with that matchup, and someone else comes in with a completely different idea. Right, no, I think you're wrong. Like you can't tell. You have to tell the computer what you want it to say. Like, yeah. And the thing with like with human error is like if you get that wrong, that's the whole process that's fucked up. But that's 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 my concern. Is it, all you need for the computer program to go shit up is one player to get the matchups wrong. Yep. I mean, the other concern is Daniel runs it off his own servers. So the way he described it to me is if his kids just wander over and unplug something, suddenly Sweden beep boop no longer beeps nor boops. Yeah. The other slight downside with um, with app-driven uh, matchmaking, and we found it a little bit because we were playing against, I think Sfera's team were also just applicationing the crap out of the uh, pairing process. They had an extremely and- cute spreadsheet which listed things in, and this is a holdover from Warhammer Fantasy and the fact that it doesn't really translate well over to, I imagine, Norwegian, but they called things like big win, little win, little loss, big loss. And I just found it so cute. Right. But the problem was that it meant that during the pairing process, 
they would, you know, hand us two sheets. We'd go, you know, we'd walk away, have a quick chat. Anyone fancy this? Oh, I don't quite like that. Yeah, no, that's not great for me. Actually, we need to leave me for that player later on. Okay, great. We'll put him forward. Meanwhile, they went away and had five minutes per round spreadsheeting the crap out of everything. Um, and it did sort of slow down the day it's a bit. It's worth noting that in theory, you're meant to do that on the clock. Yeah, yeah. To be honest, I, if I'm being fair to them, I don't think they went over clock, but they got to the point where we did pull the clock out, which we hadn't done in any other round. Now, it's a, it's a system that's designed for use for WTC lists, right? Because we'll know all of them several weeks in advance. There'll be plenty of time for people to plug those lists into spreadsheets, go through them and such. We'll sit yeah, and doing do real time just like longer. we do. And then it won't be oh, here's these lists on the day, right, everybody go away and rate every single one of them, generate 25 unique inputs, and then put them into the spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah, I think that was kind of... My only problem with the percentage-driven uh, application is that they don't include list chicken, which is kind of important in this. Yes, absolutely. That's another point. That's a very good point. Yeah, it doesn't really... There's no... Because, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but in the Czech team for WTC last year, we had all the big win, little win, all that crap, but we had it just colour-coordinated. But we had grey, which was list chicken. Like... Yeah. So, so Sometimes someone will, will, like, will either call your bluff or be like, I'm going to play out the list, and if you fuck up, I win. And just, yeah. like, just chance it. Just, like, you make a mistake, I'm going to win. But if I don't, yeah. you, if you don't, you'll, I'll lose. Um, and like you can't, and just you like, can't no. tell computer how to do that. That's just human yeah. human instinct. I don't know. I, especially, it feels weird because I mean, me and Mark. Um, for those who don't know, like me and Mark, and, and also Ben, we spent quite a bit of time last year doing a lot of matchup um, pairing process planning in the week before WCC. And since then, Mark's been kind enough to run through a few uh, sort of. Uh, calculations of scenarios um this year as well because it's just something i have an interest in and i i like trying to see how my ideas match up against other people's um and mark's pretty good at this even though he is crap at the game he's, he's quite good at um pairing it is literally so, my only purpose in life is to look at a spreadsheet and go i think we will probably win this if we do this this and this so the yeah so start very Simon, the start of the trick to learning it is to start playing competitive pokemon video games Yes, 100%. If anybody... Right, this is where I go off on a tangent. Fuck you all, we're talking Pokemon. If anybody wants to get good, not only at the pairing process, but I think this is extremely valuable for po uh, for War Machine in general, play fucking Pokemon. Play it competitively. You will learn so many useful skills. It's a prediction-based game, and if you can predict how somebody is going to react to you in the team-building process... Uh, not team building process, sorry, the pairing process would be a better way to describe it. You can force some poor choices, especially later on when it comes to the final picks that can and will win you rounds. We were heavily advantaged in several rounds at WTC 2018 because of this, and Ben and I both play it quite extensively at various points in our lives. We are good at this, probably mostly because of that. So yeah. yeah, but when we say play Pokemon, we mean go on Google, search for Pokemon Showdown, download it, pick your favorite Pokemon, make a team, and just play a fuck ton of games. It's the free other advantage, and it's fun. Yeah, the other advantage is that you will feel that War Machine is balanced by comparison. <laughs> you'll never complain about RNG again. <laughs> oh, absolutely not. Um, you'll never complain about Erratas again. Oh, but, it'll be wonderful. You'll just be so zen. It's like, no matter what... I'm not seeing Landorus T on every single fucking lead ever again. <laughs> to this get is brilliant. <laughs> to get back on topic, Mark is right that it's um it's a really predictive game and it makes it much easier to like read what your opponent's gonna give you in matchup processes and make those quick predictions and get ready for it and trap stuff. And I don't know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I just I like the idea that a that a player is good at that and that a player's mind works that way. Um and I respect the hell out of these applications and the people that are trying to make them and i'm sure like that as a dinosaur i'm going to be in in a couple of years i'm just going to be totally wrong and every team will have an application doing it for them or whatever but i just i can't help but feel um against it somehow not against it as in i think it's wrong or that it's like a moral issue or anything. i just i don't want to use it myself yeah but i should be there to help people not to drive the decisions Maybe. Yeah, maybe if you look at it that way, you, I, I, it, maybe I'm looking at it wrong. You might be right. You might be right. All right. So against Sweden Beat Boop, um, round four and the finals. Um, Mark, tell us about your opponent and the game. 
So I had the absolute pleasure of playing against Robin Anderson, who I don't know what the release schedule of his episode of this podcast will be, but I think it's fairly well known. Should be that, coming out very soon. Okay. I think it's fairly well known that he won the Swedish Masters. Congratulations to him, by the way. I had the pleasure to watch his finals game. Uh, fantastically played on his part. Really a pleasure to watch. And Robin is always lovely to play against. We'd played recently at the Scottish Masters, where I managed to continue my streak of bamboozling him with something silly. And this game, I decided to mix it up a bit. So the matchup ended up being Assyria into Balder 1. I felt that because of seeing Kruger 2 in his pairing, it was worth dropping Assyria on the off chance that he might just play Kruger 2 and I might just get to walk all over him. Um, Robin. Just for reference, Kruger 2, it might be worth mentioning, Bones or Host. Oh, beg pardon. Kruger 2 was played in a fairly standard Bones variant, double walled Guardian and double walled Warden. I didn't look at it too closely. It's Kruger and Bones. It doesn't vary too. Sure, sure. I mean, when you say Bones, Bones is Bones. There's not a huge, like, you know. Indeed. Just, I'm sure just to every Kruger bones 2 player yep. is simultaneously having a huge aneurysm at the amount of minor variables that I've overlooked. But, guys. I don't care. You cast a shit anyway. Just get over it. Anyway, so Robin decided to play Balder 1 into me. I think it was more of a comfort drop. And in hindsight, based on the terrain that was on the board and the scenario we were playing, which was Anarchy, it would certainly have been better for me to play Gareth 2 into the matchup. However, I lacked experience into the post-Oblivion Balder lists with my Gareth list. And preferred to play what I was more skilled in because, as Ben was saying, at this level and at this tight a matchup, it does come down to skill games. I mean, that didn't work for me because Robin definitely skilled me in this game, played excellently on scenario, made sure that I couldn't really break up my brick too early to come again. What and was the scenario? Again? Anarchy. Anarchy, I Anarchy I sorry. I, I missed it. I'd zoned out. Right. Wrong. So I couldn't break my brick quickly enough to keep massively relevant on scenario, managed to stay in the game, but Robin had a consistent lead and was pressuring well. Um, and then post my feet turn, where I went in for a Storm Raptor and unfortunately didn't pick it up, Robin had what I can only describe as the worst dice I've ever seen in any competitive game of War Machine. Um, in six years of playing, I have never seen somebody roll so poorly, uh, so consistently. We're talking things like a stone skinned Ravager, a Storm Raptor, and I believe Caleb from the Death Wolves getting a charge with a combi strike into the front and back of a Trident and not killing it, which when I plugged that into Wads Machine, it basically just said 100%. So that was somewhat surprising. Um, the other Trident taking way, way too much effort to kill on the other flank and draining resources that could definitely have been used more productively elsewhere. And that allowed me to sort of claw my way back into the game. It came down to a dicey assassination on Balder with no beasts left to transfer to, hiding in the corner of the right-hand zone and getting punched a lot by a phoenix, which left him on one box, he then died to a fire damage roll, which was just a perfect ending. Robin, absolute gent, very sanguine about the whole thing. Um, he said to me the only reason that it might have um, annoyed him was if it had cost his team the round. But spoiler alert, um, my massive luck sacking of him didn't matter in the greater scheme of things because my teammates are better than me and managed to make sure we won the whole thing 5-0. Uh, so, spoilers for the subsequent games, but I'm sure you'll all manage. Anyway, moving on to, I believe, Jake is next in the lineup. He is, he is. Just just because I've written it down in that way, <laughs> it's, it's, it's completely random. Um, Jake, you are... I know, I've forgotten what you played against. What, was, what did you get? So, I got um, Fiona. Fiona, uh, so, uh, Mercenaries, Fiona in the Steelhead team. Was that Hugo in Nordland? Yes. Oh, I want to say right. yes. I think it, if it was him, he was the gentleman who knocked me very nicely out of the first round of the Masters. So um, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that for most of the rest of the weekend, everyone seems to give him a thrashing. Right, what's, um, <laughs> what's, what happened in the Fiona game? So against, uh, so I think Fiona is an absolutely amazing caster. Like her, her spell list, her tools, and especially in that Soldiers of Fortune theme, is just ridiculous. She's got 
Um, so that's called Befuddle. So if you've not read a card, it is mental. She also has um, Rasheth's arc noding ability, but she can pick a unit and they don't die when they're arced through. Right. Uh, she's got a damage buff. She's got Befuddle. Um, she's got a self sack spell, which is situationally amazing. It can make basically one model in the unit immune to free strikes, so it can always contest. <coughs> uh-huh. And it's only command range for that clause. It's not like, not within three. It's just within command. Um, oh, so you can just leg it yeah. and just sack sack on a couple of hits yeah. and run into it. So you can pretty much always contest with it. Um, what else does she have? She has um, occultation and chasen. Yeah, occultation, chasen, and one so of the fire. best feats in the game. What's the feat? Uh, minus one uh, dice to hit and damage when you're in her control. When you're in a control range. It's absolutely phenomenal against melee armies and does nothing to gun lines. Okay. Pretty much, yeah. It is a fantastic, fantastic feat. Does it look at magic? Yep. Everything. Every attack and damage roll you make if you're in her control range. If you're within 14 of Which her, you take that. You might minus one attack and damage dice. Um, right. So it's got anarchy, so it's one of Zal's least favoured favourable scenarios. Um, so I was I feel a bit of an, up, an uphill battle against this one. Um, so I, we deployed. He had a, a blockade, uh, some cav, a toro. Um, so he only had um, one minion of cav, which I thought was a little bit strange. But he had the toro and the blockade in the list. Most people pick one or the other. They had go like triple toro or blockade. He had both because there's some really cute counter charge shenanigans you can do where you can befuddle a model forward, trigger counter charge, and then charge with your toro. Uh, just run, you know, run that again slowly. <laughs> ben? Befuddle does not change the ownership of the model that you're moving. So you befuddle something, you advance it towards your Toro, when it ends its advance, your Toro can trigger countercharge. At which point you are then able to continue and charge. Yeah, because it didn't activate. <laughs> so you can countercharge your full eight inches and then just activate and charge something. What does that make the active threat of a Toro in that case? Uh, Assuming they've got a befuddle 19. target. So in that list, it's 18. There's a crane for 20, and you could, in theory, befuddle the thing you'll go into as well for 23. God damn. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah, and you can trigger more than one counter charge from one befuddle, so... Yes, that's also true. Fuck's sake. <laughs> hence the triple Toro list, I yep. guess. Right. Hence, tri- hence the triple Toro list. It's pretty, pretty dumb. Um... So Are you switching over after WTC? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, might, I might be. I, I own Mercs. I was meant to be playing Mercs at WTC, but I wasn't sure they'd have enough stuff out in time. And Grim can better. Um, <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I'm Ben, and I play Grim Yeah, I didn't believe Private Press could output the blockader in time for WTC, so I didn't want to risk it. I, I support your lack of faith in Private yeah, Press. I just, I just didn't trust they'd be able to make this model in time. <laughs> That's that's absolutely fair, <laughs> right? Um, so you're running into Fiona, you're running into a blockader, a Toro, and a minion at Cav, and what's happening? And like, there's, there's some, there's like loads of the boys as well. There's like there's Halberdiers, <coughs> there's Alexia two in there. There's all the other usual support bollocks, Arcanists, Crane, Iron Headman, whatever the fuck he's called. Um, so it comes down to it. So uh, I go second. So I, I win the role. I go. I go second. I'm pretty sure. Basically, we just run each other because we've both got quite linear threat ranges, apart from I've got the Mammoth. So the Mammoth is just... Well, and he's got shoot. the Befuddle crap. Pardon? And he's got the Befuddle crap. Yeah. So Befuddle works on my stuff. It's the only thing that gets around a uh, immovable object. Right. So you can Befuddle a Supreme Guardian. It also works on Harvey's initiatives. Yeah. Okay. It's really fucking sad. You need to roll a hit roll, right? Please tell me you need to yeah, roll a hit roll. Yeah, but she's like Magic yeah, but she's 7. Magic 7 with Silas. Ah. And can boost. <laughs> so oh, well. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty guaranteed. Um, so I have to basically I have to keep killing my own men to keep souls on the supreme, or the supreme is going to die to the Toro Toro and like a few right. men charging it. But then on the on the turn he feats. This is where like the game sort of changed from this dancing around game. He he feats, puts his blockade really far forward, and then runs his cav from the side where my supreme is to behind his blockade. Basically, to, to sweep round okay. on that on on basically the other zone, so that means I can be a lot more aggressive because I have my mammoth and my supreme on that side of the ball on the the opposite side to his board to the blockader. So it means I can be a lot more aggressive on that side because there's only just like the shit boys just on that side now. There's nothing really hard hitting. Right, he's just given up on it basically. Not really given up on it. He's switched sides. He, I think he's going to try and collapse my left before I collapse his 
left. Okay. Um, that's the play, and it very nearly pays off. But I get a bit lucky on his feet turn. Um, a car and some boys go into the soup, the um, uh, the blockader, even on feet turn. So it's like minus one dice. I do about thirty points of damage to it, or something stupid. Um, All right. So I, I I chip it down pretty well, and then the following turn I can kill it. So that's like the big attrition he swing. He has got a lot of repair available. Not enough. Right. Not enough at all. And then I, so then that turn I also feet. So then he can't kill much of my stuff. And like I run the supreme at him. The mammoth is like both the mammoth and the supreme are like at the top of a circle zone. Like I'm trying to win a side as quickly as possible because I can see the attrition going badly because he the blockade has killed loads before it went in. Um, but the, the game starts to grind down. Um, like we're getting a bit low on clock. Um, scenario points are going mental. Like so, we're, we're both scoring on each other's turns. It's it's getting down to the absolute nitty gritty wire. It ends up coming to um, bottom of seven. His bottom of seven. Yes, he went second. His bottom of seven. Uh, he has two models, two cavalry. They have to get into my circular zone. Each one has to take a fr- no two cavalry to get into the. Into a flag, sorry, his what, what would be his flag, but I've taken over, and he has to take a free strike each off a mammoth. If I fail one of the free strikes, I lose. Um, because okay. he contests, he scores two, I only score one, and then he wins on scenario on control points. I get on both seven, of yeah. them, so we both score two, and I win on army points, bottom of seven. Oh, uh, I win. Squeaky. I win by well. I still got my supreme and my turtle, my um, my mammoth alive. Mammoth. That's literally all I've got. Right. right. I've got no infantry. I've got a baden, uh, and like a hammer boy or something like that left. I've got nothing else. But I've still got my two right. huge bases. So the game grinds down fantastically, like really, really close. And say, I'm glad it comes down to. Again, I was that close on the scenario. And so Hugo's a, a fantastic opponent. Everything was just lovely about playing against him. Um, so and really, really good. And if, if people haven't played it, Fiona is scary as fuck to play against. I'm not, yeah, like, I, don't, I don't like seeing it on paper, mainly just because I, I, I never like seeing Mercs just because I don't know what the hell's going on. There's no Merc player in the Czech Republic that I'm aware of. So the, um, All the Merc players are in America, I think. There's, there's right, quite a lot. Right. Well, that's there. okay. That's fine. That's fine. They can stay there. <laughs> yeah, they can just... That's all right. Yeah, not that. Like, Canada as well. There's there's a lot of Merc players in Canada as well. That's a problem. That's a genuine issue. <laughs> right. Um, all right. So round four... That's it. That was the finals. Um, that was the finals, but we've still got Ben's game, I'm pretty sure. Yes. Yes, lovely. And you had um, the lovely Morgan Ackerson, uh, right? I, play, I played Morgan. He had um, a neat little Rasheth DOA list with... Um, uh god what was in his fucking list um shaman agonizer Kraya, roadhog gladiator um hang on turtles. roadhog yep is that legit now or i mean the roadhog's kind of a neat piece it's actually the gladiator i think is terrible okay like the, the roadhog is a solid piece it's got a really long threat range and just race people to death sometimes I genuinely don't know uh, minion stuff at all. Like, um, it's got um, assault. Its animus is sprint, and it can take D three damage to gain plus two speed. Okay. So before rush, it can like walk seven, spray ten, or assault ten, spray ten. With rush, it can walk nine, spray ten. I like these are upsetting numbers. Yeah, they're, they're not great. <laughs> these are upsetting numbers, but I don't, I don't actually think the gladiator is great in the list. Um, then he has a unit of the ambushing idiots, um, uh, blood runners. A unit of uh, brigands and some generic support pieces. And like, was there any there. discussion prior to the like? Was it very clear to both of you? Oh, it's Rasheth versus X, or was it like mm, maybe? I it's mean, this, maybe he it's had um, he had a list. This is other list. I'm sure. I'm sure he wrote a list on his piece of paper. Um, I think it might have been Zaltu. I actually don't recall. Okay. It was. It was. It was Immortals, and I knew I was dropping Dreamer, and that I was getting something. Fair um, enough. And I thought it was. I, I can't remember what the Immortals was, but I was expecting Rasheth. Okay. So I'm gonna guess that it was something I didn't think he'd give me. Um, it. Yeah. Um I actually they picked tables. I got what I think is a really good table for the matchup I had to play, and Morgan picked sides and gave me what I think was the best side for the matchup I had to play. So I had um a big threat from his list is the ambushing bloodrunners into a Rasheth assassination on my fairly squishy cards. Yeah, we'll take a brief break here for Ben to fix his headset. 
I should start coming up with some hold music, shouldn't I? Like, do do yeah. Do, ne- do, next do, time we do back. this, remind me to get a different headset than the one I normally use. <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, the, the, with that in mind, the best feature I get is an absolutely enormous obstruction that lets me sit my cast next to it and be completely immune to the assassination from that side of the table. Um, basically, it's a, a huge piece of like, it's, I think it's like a rubble shaped, but it's some structures. It's covered in stones that no one wants to stand their models on. Yeah. And it's on the back of my left-hand zone, which means that if he tries to run around the back, there's no way Rishyeth with Speed 4 is getting into arcing range of those guys. And he can't run around the front, because that's where every single model in my army is. Which uh-huh. means that Dreamer can basically play her game. And then on top of that, in between his flag and that same zone, there's a wall, which, spoiler alert, my plan is to run at him as hard as I can. And I'm going to put my entire army behind that wall, so that the turtles can't get to where they need to be to hit stuff. Okay. Um, and then there's another building on the back of his zone, which lets me... Which basically says that if you want to put your brigands in this zone to score them, they have to come all the way around the building, or you have to put a different unit in there, which is also really inconvenient for him. So this was um, an example of what we said at the very, very start of the show, of Grimkin having a plan and just getting terrain that I helps got, them execute it's it. It's not the table that I would have picked had I picked tables. I would have liked something like... I would have liked a big building right in the middle. But Why do you given think you this, um, I don't know. I think it was fairly late in the process. Right, okay. I think we were near the end. The table, the table. there was nothing line of sight blocking in the middle, which is what I would ideally like. But given that that's not what I have, I got a bunch of terrain pieces that I was really happy with. And then I think Morgan gave me a side, which is the side I would have chosen, was I was using sides. Did you just say that you of... would prefer a table with no line of sight blocking in the middle? No, no. I, I would prefer to have a huge building. In right, the right, yeah, 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 okay. Or failing that, a forest. Because I was thinking against Rasheth, um, like, Jesus. No, no, I, I would prefer to have the middle of the table filled with something obnoxious. That yeah. I can kite turtles around, but I didn't get that. But I got something that was also good for me, so that's fine. Um, so I run up, he runs up, does a little bit of shooting, and I do some measuring, so I can put one clock under Enrage into a turtle, and then just run my army at both the turtles. The brigands are, because it's um, anarchy, like he's got his centre is... Both, um, both turtles are on one side and the brigands are on the other side. So my plan basically is that I put an enraged clock into one turtle. He does about half of it. That's fine. I fuck up slightly and end up running my death knell into the front line of my army, but whatever. <laughs> when you um, say fuck up slightly. Uh, I'm not used... To, I basically forget that Karyana isn't a gremlin swarm and I can't just run through her. Um, so like, if she goes to enrage the turtle, she stands in the path the death knell needs to run to where it actually wants to get to. Okay. Um, so I run... I run the death knell basically into the front line of my army. Um, I paralyze one turtle do about half to the other and paralyze and then just run all of my heavies at the turtles uh, anchoring them all behind this wall that makes it hard for him to access enough stuff to do work um i then yeet the gorehound into the center of the brigands and engage about six of them um the gorehound's fairly important because it means that he either has to accept that those six brigands are doing jack shit on feet turn or he has to ambush and kill it which means dreamer is no longer scared of being assassinated by the ambush and i can just walk her into that circular zone and start scoring points okay fair um, yep which is pretty much what happens. He ambushes, kills the Gorehound. He kills the Death Knell and does like one and a half clocks, I think, and kills the Cage Rager. That sounds like quite a lot. Which is like solid, but not really enough work. And it leaves me with enough left to kill a turtle, fuck up the other one, stall out some more. I kill the Roadhog. How much like, did the one win. enraged uh, clock do to the turtle, by the way? I think it did about 15. It's quite a lot. Yeah, one well, rage manifest. Like, it's a. Those are some decent things. I just oh, you had every manifest on it as well, okay. Yeah, I'm Dreamer. Well, I know, but I just wondered whether you were going that close to... Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, so... The ambush assassination isn't happening because you can't get around the back as discussed. And because the worry position, my entire army is in the way of coming around the front. Okay. And, like, without okay. without spells, he's like, he can't feet on me because he's speed four. And, like, rat five turtles aren't shooting my death 15 caster to death. <laughs> it's just not a thing that's happening, even if he tries. No. no. Um... But so the next turn I get to finish that left turtle with like two wax and the skin and some gremlin swarm damage. Okay. Hang on, gremlin swarms work on uh button engines. My, head, my headset died, but I assume that you were complaining about gremlin swarms being able to hit turtles. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess that was what was happening. <laughs> um yeah, they're just but, slowly deteriorating. We're getting more and more issues. <laughs> yeah, I think they are. I'll have to buy some new ones. All right, they're like all right. wireless headphones, but the battery doesn't work and um my charge lead keeps falling out. Okay, okay. Basically. Oh, never mind. So, um, so how yeah. did it? How did it come to the end game? How did it conclude? Um, so from there, I start slow rolling scenario with Dreamer in the left zone. Um, a gremlin swarm in the right zone means that he basically has to commit 
some of Richard's activation to killing a Grumman Swarm, which isn't a thing he's desperate to do. Um, no. And it means that he doesn't start scoring the right zone for a couple turns more than he should. And I start picking up points on my flag and my zone, I kill his objective, I'm able to contest his flag pretty consistently, and I end up um, rolling on scenario somewhere around turn 5. Um, but if I hadn't been able to, I would be able to have the very amusing turn, where I put the Clock Tree Sanus on Resheth and Paralyzed him so we could move a maximum of 2 inches. <laughs> Just um, hold him in don't, place and I don't everything know that he, Yeah, I don't know that he could have done anything about it. Like, I only had a clock and a skin of moans, but he only had... He would have had, like, a few brigands and a few bloodrunners, and, like, not much else. It sounds a bit like my dream of one day running a Blightbringer with the no-spell aura towards Rasheth, and then just every turn waddling around after him. <laughs> just a potato yeah, running I, after I, a fatty, like... I, I just... I don't know that... If I hadn't once her, I don't know that he could have found a way to keep Rasheth alive, because he had no beasts left. Right. He would have right. been able to clean up... Do you think that was a problem of his battle group? No, he played. He just played his played the game and had to use his battle group, and it had died. Okay. No, uh, it, it it had just died over the course of the game. He would have been able to kill my skin moans, but the clock staring at Rasheth was in a position where not much would be able to get to it, and he wouldn't have been able to escape. So I think that he would have died the next turn anyway, probably. Fair enough. Um, um, so now we need to pay a bit of homage to the uh, to the two Danes. So just give me, obviously not round by round or anything, but how did they? What were their results in the end? How did they do? Mikkel won all his games. All four. Um, yeah, Mikkel, Mikkel was undefeated. Absolute hero. Wow. He um, was, in fact, including a Including winning a very important game against the Norwegians, who we only beat 3-2. Uh, Kasper only won in the last round, which is interesting because it kind of illustrates the point Jake was making about human error and the Sweden matchmaking machine. Right. Yeah, you, you mentioned that, but we didn't go into detail. So w w Mark tried to, but he was being overly toxic and it was difficult to hear what was actually the meaning. W w what went wrong with their... Uh... So... it. It did roughly what we thought, what everyone thought it would do, right? It, it outputted four skill matchups, which it which it arranged into what it thought was a favourable configuration, and it was probably. Right. Do, 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 do. <laughs> I should definitely have thought of an actual tune for this. Yeah, for sure. It like it it arranged four skill matchups into what it thought was a favourable configuration, and then gave Johan a favourable matchup against Casper, which is roughly what we had in our heads when we looked at the matchups. Like we thought that Casper would lose to Johan. Okay. Because it's quite hard to run Silvestro because of Sylvester's Cloud. And then, hard, um, yeah. and then we'd have four skill matchups. And then they perfectly demonstrated it by not winning the skill matchups and also Johan making a user error and getting round. Yeah, I mean, you have to give credit. If, if someone is going to get Sylvester killed in a situation where he absolutely shouldn't be, it is Johan. Can we right. say it properly, yeah, it, by the it, way? It, he got rando wandoed. Yes. Shut up. <laughs> um, like, no, no, no flame. The robot was really cool and, like, it was a really good... I'll, I'll fill in here, which is to say that Casper's a round god, and uh, if, you, if you're going to make it happen with round, Casper's the man to get it done. Uh, he will find yeah. a way. Yeah, yeah, he will. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I still have the photo on my phone of the situation that my callous one was in when he picked him out of there um, and pulled him and pushed him about 28 times to slot him through the tiniest little gap that he'd found and made. Um, so, yeah. No, uh, no discredit to him at all. But um, that actually leads me to a little question. So, um, cheers very much for the battle reports. I'm, I hope they were useful to people. Um, they were certainly interesting for me to listen to. But um, bussing, bussing, the process of throwing a player under the bus during a five-man pairing process. How useful is that? And like, how common do you think it is? What are your opinions on it? Do you think it's a mistake? What are your thoughts? Bussing, Jake. Um, it's a weird one, but I don't like to bus people because it's you're using one of your um, one of your almost like matchup picks to give them a free win. Because you're saying a bus is that you're giving your opponent a free win or a game which is very unfavoured to you. That's and I'm yeah. not a huge fan of doing that. I see where you can do it and where there is advantages advantages into it but I'm definitely not a fan of doing it. The only way I think we you bust someone is if they could win the matchup, even if you bust them. So, like, uh, I, I can't give an example, but, like, something like going, this is a, this is like a, a least chicken, and I might just randomly blow it up. And I might just randomly blow up his wallcaster. Well, I mean, that's what Ran was right. doing. Yeah. Right? That's not like Ran. I must say, that win. sounds like Ran. You just Ran someone into someone he probably shouldn't win, but it's Ran, and he might. He's got, he's got an hour to figure it out. You might win. I'd rather do that than bust someone into like just an auto lose because that's just not helping anyone in the game at all, apart right. from your opponents. Mark, what do you think? Bussing. So in two years now, let's say roughly 
of the current Knights lineup, or as close as we've been to it, we've not made the decision to bus anyone ever um, in any round of team play. And that's a decision that I would stand by as one of the people mostly responsible for making it. And it's one that I would recommend to anybody wanting to succeed in a team format. If you are bussing someone, and if somebody is in a position where bussing them is even a viable option, not necessarily the best option, but a viable option, then you have made a mistake at the list selection and team building stage of team tournaments, and you should compensate in that for next time, basically. Excuse and me. To, so, to, quali- to, to quantify that a little bit, absolutely. you mean I, I, I'm going to put words in your mouth and then you can correct them and swirl them around and spit them out in a better way, mm-hmm. which is that you, what, you, what I think you're saying is that assuming you build a balanced team composition with balanced list pairings, which are good, then there should be, theoretically, no situation in which it's correct to bust somebody. However, if you make a mistake and your team is too skewed or unbalanced or bad, then you could find yourself in a situation where you're so screwed that you need to bust someone in order to have a chance and it's kind of a roll the dice situation. Is that approximately what you're saying? It's approximately what I'm saying with one caveat, which is I would say that balance is a very tricky word to define almost like in the context of what we're speaking of here. You can have a team where a player has a lot of dodges where I believe, just to be clear for somebody who has no experience in team format whatsoever, it dodges a match where you just don't want to see it. Like, if you play that, you're screwed. So with that in mind, it's possible for a player to have a lot of dodges um, and still be a valuable part of a team so long as you can manoeuvre them correctly. And so, so long, long as they don't share those dodges with indeed, the members of your so team. so long as there's synergy with the rest of the team. So you right. could have someone who's dodging like, I don't know. So the bar we set this year was dodge maybe, a cu- have a couple of factions as you dodge if you absolutely have to. Try not to dodge too much. I think it's long since been cracked that the secret doing well WTC is to just bring balanced steamroller parents, play the skill games and win them, and try not to have your dodges overlap. And that is, that is. Yeah, and I mean, that's not a particularly controversial statement, right? But in the situations where you do have to have those dodges, which, excuse me, I think have come up a lot more in the meta now, it's a testament to how the game's evolved over the past sort of, and this may seem unfamiliar to you, Simon, I believe you didn't play Mark II, did you? Um, I don't know. The game was very sort of static and list building back then for the most part. It wasn't a great time. People sort of knew what the matchups were, um, and there were very few competitive options compared to what they are now. Like, say say I'm a Signar player, there's probably, like, in the Flames of Darkness um, that we've got now, there's probably, like, I don't know, eight, nine, ten more parents that you can build in Signar that are at least sort of semi-viable. Jake's nodding his head here, which I'm assuming means he agrees with me. Like, if you look at Signar back then, there was, like... There were three lists. Yeah, there were three lists. Uh, play two of them. There were four lists. Come on, guys. Watch your fourth, then. Any one. All three Hades and Kane oh, 2. Go. Okay, fine. Kane 2 as well. So, point yeah. is, though, right, there was, like, no diversity. So it was really easy to sort of tailor your parents. Whereas now, even if you've got those two factions where you can just go, right, I dodged these, keep me out with these, cool. You will look at the lists at WTC, and you will see someone's pairing, and you will go, well, fuck, I can't actually play this. This is really bad for me. Yeah, it's, whether it's that's, just like, oh, that's a bit yeah, of a Whether yeah. that's list chicken and you don't want to risk it, or a combination of various tech elements that they've chosen to put in their list that are perhaps a bit non-standard, sometimes you're just fucked. And I've kind of lost the thread of where I was going with this, but it makes the team process... It can be testing at times. You basically just got to hope that you don't hit too many of those. Any tournament win is about luck. Like to some extent, yeah. There's always a bit. I don't think anybody's right? I mean, ever you know, won a tournament yeah. without being lucky. Fuck yeah. us, we got lucky in some rounds. We just did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah you've got to, any you've got tournament to. any of us have ever won, we've won because we got lucky at certain stages. Um, and Tomash, like, what do you think about it? Like, we, we, we've asked, we've asked the boys. What, what do you think? Is bussing someone something that Poland have ever done or not? I mean, what, what are your thoughts? So I think last year, uh, Australia, the. Team Flaming Gallants, I believe, the, the team that won WTC. Uh-huh. Had Jeffy there with Retribution. 
And what they were saying, they thought that retribution is fine and the pairing they brought will be fine in the meta. But actually every round they were uh, figuring out the matchup process, it wasn't fine and they needed to throw Jeffy under the bus. I might say something wrong here, but this is what I remember them saying. I mean, so, it's fine. It's second-hand info. Like, if they want to come and correct it, they feel, feel, feel free, yeah. Yeah, so... They won the WTC with someone that actually had to be thrown under the bus. And I believe they did it in the finals where uh, Jeffy had a game he couldn't, he, he, he just couldn't win. Like it was uh, Iceria into nine slayers and spread the net, something like this. And we were choosing tables, so... Yeah, I mean, Austria, Austria Dandy, to give another example from last year, they did remarkably well. Um... You know, they had, they had, they had a 6-0 player, uh, Daniel Mayer, and they had, um, you know, they, they had very solid results and reached, I think, semifinals, I want to say, because um, they played against... I, my memory's so bad, I don't want to say they played against us and then find out I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they did. Uh, I mean, they definitely played against us, but I can't remember whether it was in the semis. But no, because we played against you in the semis, right? Yes, correct. So we play, anyway, so they made it to the quarterfinals or whatever. Like they had an amazing run and they had a guy whose job it was to just get bust into people and then attempt to minion slam their caster. Like yeah. I so while I totally respect your guys approach and of course your results speak for themselves. There are a lot of other countries that are making bussing work well. Yeah. But you know, to give you a chance to come back at that again, is that just because you think well, they're making the best of a slight cock up in the preparation stage? Or do you think that it's just potentially they've got another way of doing things than you? I mean, I think if you gave them the choice, they wouldn't have brought a pair that was literally worthless. <laughs> like, they, they, would have, they would have written good lists instead and not realized on the day that they hadn't written good lists. So, so yeah, I mean... I feel like they're making the best sense. of a mistake that they've realized they've made. At least right. in terms of the Aussies. Right. Okay. Okay. But it, I mean, it, so we 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 sort of we're vaguely agreed that it's a good way of dealing with a crappy situation that you should try and avoid in the first place. It's doable, but by I think we we feel that you should avoid it as much as possible, unless it's unavoidable. Then make your make the uh, educated uh, assessment of where where you're gonna, where you're going to go with it, what you're going to do with it. Yeah. Fair enough. I Fair think enough. it's important that bust people uh, have some out in the game, like an assassination or something like this. Yeah. Because you cannot make a team of five Grimkins, so you will never have a good matchup into everything. Right? <laughs> I mean, you could make three Grimkins I mean, and just win every round off the back of that, right? We, 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 we've we seriously considered it. Don't, don't. I mean, I hear Heretic <laughs> double piggybacks is insanely good if Ben wants to comment on that at all. I'm sure it's a solid list if you don't play scenarios. <laughs> yeah, if you just play on a... No, I mean, terrain, like, it's, a, it's a decent list. I'm just not sure it's as good as other things you could do. Fair enough. All right, we, we, we're, hitting, we're entering the uh, we're entering the two hour mark here, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna do some quick fire stuff. And by the way, the episode won't end up being two hours because Tom will do some audio wizardry, and it'll end up being less. But um, in real time, we're at two hours. So, quick fire: Who are the top five, and in what particular order? Mark. So. Um... I'm assuming that we're discussing things in terms of where we are right now at this second year of our Lord 2019. Um, Going into WTC. No full Infernals release, basically. Correct. Okay. Top, Grimkin. I think that's fairly uncontroversial. And then every other choice on this list gets a bit spicy, so... Yeah, well, bad luck, because you've got to just get them in order. Let's go. Yeah, I mean, being wrong on the internet, this will be easy. Okay, so Scorn, second place. Third place... Protectorate. Fourth yep. place. Um, circle, fifth place, Retribution. Boom. Lovely. Jake? Uh, Grimkin first. Scorn second. Yep. Third, Kado. Mm. Yep. Fourth, Menoth. Yep. Fifth, it'll be a tie between Rhett and Circle. I'm going to have to push you for one, I'm afraid. Rhett. Lovely. Ben? Grimkin, Circle, Scorn, Protector, and Mercenaries. Oh, shit. Grimkin, Follow. Circle, Scorn. <laughs> what the hell put bollocks on a list of five? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, writing, I'm, I'm trying to say what he said so that I can remember it and write it down with a pencil, and suddenly I've just got bollocks ringing in my ears. Right. Grimkin, Circle, Scorn, Protector, and Mercenaries. Lovely. Thomas? Well, I don't want to list top five, like, in order. 
Well, bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's the system, my friend. That's that's what you're left with. So one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> no, I'm not doing it. I will divide uh, tier one into three parts. So I would say tier one of tier one would be Circle and Grimkins. Right. Then tier two of tier one would be Protectorate and Scorn. Very good. And tier three of tier one would be Crucible Guard, Retribution and Mercenaries. Yep. All right. How's he allowed eight and I was only allowed five? <laughs> it's all right. So what I've done is I've ignored everything he said and I've just taken the first five that he said in a specific order <laughs> and put them in a list. So he said one is Circle, two is Kin, three is Menoth, four is Scorn and five is Crucible Guard. Pretty much. So... Yeah, <laughs> That's, what we've done is twisted your words there, my friend. This is the, the bad news is that he gets to do the editing later and can just twist them back again. Um, yeah. Right, so what we've got is a pretty solid agreement that Kin are first. Yeah. Then we've got um, a bit of disagreement about Circle. We've got them um, featuring fourth, not featuring at all, featuring second and featuring first or joint first. Um, so circle are a bit up in the air. We've got Scorn sitting at second for most people, bit of third, bit of fourth. Pom sitting in the middle of the top, like everyone's happy that they're kind of third, fourth, basically just on the back of Harbinger, I assume. Yep. A lot of people are saying we've got Rhett around the fifth spot. Um, but some interesting ones, and ones we're going to jump on quickly, is Jake's Kador pick for number three. Why is that? Because Jim has fucked Jake so many times. That is 100% true. I've been fucked by Kador so, so much for so long. No, no, be specific. You've been fucked by Jim. Every yeah. other kid or player's fine, it's just Jim. Yeah, so Jim has been on the England team for the past four years. He's not on a team this year. He's been playing Kador for about that length. And he just I just can't beat the man. Literally just can't beat the man. Fair enough. And also, they're really good at the moment. Like, Old Witch. Yeah. yeah. Old Witch in Wolves, or Vlad 2 in Wolves, is a fantastic gen- right, generalist list. Then you can just pair with some bollocks like Karchev. Or well, can't you just slap adjudicator in Menoth now? Uh, sorry, or, yeah, or you can have Vlad three with a double hand of fit adjudicator. Yeah. And yeah. like Menoth yeah. That, 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 like that list is spicy. It's fucking nuts. I did not like seeing that list on paper. I certainly think that Kador is one of the factions vying for fifth place. Um, Go on, Tomas. Yeah, I just wanted to explain why I divided those into three groups. I think that group one, so Circle and Grimkins, just get a huge boost from terrain, and also it can save a lot of their matchups. Okay. I think that they are probably one of the most versatile factions with a lot of answers. Then tier two would be Scorn and Protectorate that can just put the strongest list, like with numbers or the power level. But usually those factions also have like one or two really hard counters and table can really really fuck them like really and crucible guard made it because of pavel's uh, halberdier tough roll <laughs> no crucible guard uh, retribution and mercenaries without maybe mercenaries the retribution and crucible guard for me made it because they play very well into top factions into other top factions they are really versatile but just because of that okay and mercenaries are the not only because they are versatile but also they are the most recent cid so there's a lot of unlocked potential there as well right that's a really interesting way to think about it i mean as much as i was laughing at you for not picking five that is um that is a genuine reason not to of course i'm going to ignore that and just say that you've got circle kin menoth scorn and crucible guard but from a you know more rounded perspective, that seems reasonable. Ben, you had Mercs as your fifth pick. In other words, you have pushed out Rhett. Um, I, I, I say you've pushed out Rhett. You've pushed out Rhett based on what we've seen here. And um, yeah, why? Um, because I think that Mercs, Rhett, and Kador are all pretty interchangeable in that slot, and I just picked the faction that I have. Okay, okay. So uh, that's, that's not quite true. I think there's a bunch of really cool stuff that Mercs can do now that they couldn't do six months ago that, that people haven't quite picked up and started playing yet. So Fair enough, I, fair enough. I think that we could, in theory, see a lot more Mercs appearing if people are willing to do stuff like play Hammer Strike. All right, all right. And what do we think about the other end of the spectrum? So much, much uh, smaller scope. I just want to hear about which do you think will be the least played faction? Uh, and I'm going to take Infernals out of this because they're incomplete, unless someone wants to be an absolute hero and say that someone is actually going to have less than Infernals uh, despite their incompleteness. Trolls. I see no compelling reason to play Trolls. In, in the way that we're saying that you think... The, uh, so again, to be clear, which faction will there be the least of... 
Trolls. Trolls. <laughs> trolls. Including Infernals when they're incomplete. Yeah, still trolls. <laughs> Possibly. Like, as someone who's an, an often troll apologist who really likes trolls, I think there's stuff you can do. I see no compelling reason to play trolls and present with the ability to take a faction that's not shit. <laughs> yeah. I, I okay. would go okay. like, slightly away from the trend and I'm going to say Convergence and not in a great meta place at the moment. I think I think Cock is way better off than Trolls. Yeah, yeah but, they're st- but they're still shit. I, I, I'm I think they're, uh, they're, they're pretty well, bad. interesting, because we've got some disagreement. I'm going to say Minions. No, Minions are cool. No. I, think, I think Minions are genuinely dreadful, and then on top of that, if you want to play Minions, you actually play Scorn, and people have had long enough to figure that out. There will be some Rask savants, guaranteed at dubs. Always are. Rask's so, good. Yeah, someone will just take Rask and skill people. And the Arcadius. Arcadius is alright. And Arcadius is also good. Arcadius is unbeatable, it is true. Arcadius isn't terrible. Right, I'm still calling it. I'm saying minions. We've got Tomash and Ben on trolls. We've got Jake saying convergence and Mark saying... 100% trolls. Absolutely. Every time. And all of those people are including the incomplete Infernals into that list. Right. We had six more months yes. I'd play incomplete Infernals for WTC this year, but we don't. Right, fair dues. All right, cool. Um, I'm going to skip the Hermit discussion because we're out of time. And to be honest, I think a lot has been said about the Hermit everywhere and us adding to it won't add a huge amount. Um, other than to say, I do look forward to seeing all the conversions. I want to say something about Hermit quickly. I want to ask you guys a question. Go. Would you agree he's not as strong on the table as he was in people's expectations? Um, I mean, I'm not taking Hermit to WTC. I think that it's a really good model, but the change from four points to five is actually quite significant when you're looking at a solo slot in a list. Agree. Especially a solo that you're paying for. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Jake? Um, for me, is I, I don't build him, in, build him into lists. I think, I know he's good, um, but I I never have the points for him. Like, if I've got five points to spare of a list and I've not taken a merc, mercenary solo or minion solo, I'll put him in. But I don't build lists around him. I, I know he's really good. Like, Mad Visions is insane. Being able to score a flag, all the we all know what he does. But I think he's just he's all right. I'd rather have like more other shit in my list. Yeah. My list. Would you take him if he was four? Again, it'd be the same, but it'd probably make it into more lists because he's cheaper. All right, Mark. I play Retin Infernals. I want you to take a wild guess as to what my opinion on this is. <laughs> all right, Simon. Um, the change from four to five made a really, really big difference in my eyes. So when he was four, you just windmill slam him into everything. Um, four points for visions in the majority of list is worth it alone. Having a flag sitting solo again, really handy, but there are other solos that do that. So that's less compelling. And his access to telemetry and minus two armor was something more of a bit of a bonus. With him being five points, that screws up a lot of list building. And in it, uh, when it first, when they first said, oh, we've not changed a single bit of his rules, we've just bumped his price to five, I was like, oh, well, that's going to make a huge difference, isn't it? And then actually, yeah, it did, um, because it kicked him out of one of my lists. Um, so I am taking him, but I'm taking him in one list. I think the, the, the cost adjustment um, is enough where you need to now be able to deliver him and he needs to have a, a, a Visions target that you particularly wish to protect. So if you have a weak caster or a particularly important arc node or a huge base, then he, his value goes up a ton. Um, he also sort of accidentally bones Wormwood a bit because he can just Visions a stranglehold that might be super important. And that's, that's, been, that's been the most impactful thing about Hermit for me is that I'm intending to take Wormwood to WTC. And I'm very nervous about... Hermit just dunking me. Um, so I think he'll be very important. I think he'll be very impactful. But I think he was hyped up to an unbelievable level, and I was certainly involved in that. Um, and then we've had to sort of tone that down a bit precisely because of exactly how your question was worded, which is that he performs worse on the table than he looks in reality. But if you have a way to manipulate him, namely Retribution, Wormwood, Crucible Guard, Infernal, like, uh, sorry, not Crucible Guard. They, they might have some Trances. ways. Oh, yeah, they do have ways. Sorry, Trancers, right? Um, I knew that. I, I knew there was a reason that had come to my head, but I couldn't think what it was. So if you've got those ways to manipulate him, he just becomes fucking nuts. If you can speed him up, he's fantastic. What do you think, Tomas? Do you agree with any of us, or do you think we're all wrong? No, no, I pretty much agree. I, I think he was hyped to unreasonable levels, and I think the change from five to four points was just big for him. 
Are you taking him? I'm still debating whether or not I want to bring him. Uh, I'm not bringing him in both of my lists, that's for sure. But in one of my lists, I'm still looking at his performance, whether or not he's better than the other options I can bring for those points. But it will be a decision uh, more like that I trust it's the right one, not that I know it's the right one. It's one of those where it feels like it might be a slightly defining decision point for this WTC. Yep, exactly. Because like, I could be right. Hermit could totally bone my Wormwood list. Or it might just be, oh, actually, it's fine. You know, actually, he's really good in my Wormwood list. And so overall, um, an overall benefit, you know? All right. Um, so this is the stage when everyone gets to do shout outs to absolutely nobody. Um, although with you, gents here, maybe we'll finally get a shout out. We'd like to quickly shout out War Machine Weekender, um, an event which is being held up in York. A few listeners might be interested in attending. Um, we've got um, the whole hotel that we're using for the event just booked out. Uh, accommodations available for £50 deposit now and £50, I believe, the final payment date is sometime in late September, October. Could be wrong, don't quote me on that. There's a post in War Machine Hordes General with full details. It's a fantastic event. This is the second time we've run it. Um, the last one was an absolute blowout success. We've got people coming from as far away as I believe Slovenia this time round, and we'd be more than happy to have the last few spaces filled, get a few on the reserve list as well, which does move as with all events, you've got a good chance of going on. You get a win early. Would very much recommend the event to everyone. Second it, I was there for the first iteration. It was absolutely wonderful. York is a lovely, lovely city. And if you manage to get a bit of time there, in addition to the event, I'd recommend it. Um, the organizers are superb and um, it's, it's a very friendly uh, event and place. Let's be real. One of the organizers is a cunt, but as long as you ignore me, you'll have a good time. <laughs> I was mainly referring to the other one. It's oh, fine. I just... I... <laughs> I was, I was being inclusive. Right? <laughs> um, I've got a little tiny personal shout out, which is that um, several of you may know that after WTC, I'm probably going to be stopping playing uh, Warmer Hordes, um, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, due to my sort of local meta collapsing, sadly, and switching over to other game systems and so on and so forth. Um, I've got a couple of things that I'd like to do after that, um, one of which would be maybe getting involved in organization or judging for Warmer Hordes events because basically I love all you guys and it would be a real shame for me not to continue coming and hanging out with you. Um, so if any organizers of larger events that might be able to help me out a little bit with the expenses of getting there would be interested in having an extra organizer uh, or general shouting person kicking about um then feel free to get in touch with me and i'll definitely think about it um because that's something i'd like to do uh, but in the meantime uh, what i'm going to be doing is doing a bit of twitch streaming not for warmer hordes but for online gaming content so i've got quite a lot of ideas um of things to do and just the content creation side of the um of the gaming community has really uh, appealed to me and i'd love to do a bit more of it and obviously if you enjoy the content we put out here um it's going to be me blathering on exactly as now, um, just with less guests. Um, and more tits. And more tits. I, I, yeah, we have decided that titty streaming is the way for me to go forward. So um, that's um, what's in my uh, future. And, you know, I will um, definitely let you know uh, as and when that kicks off. It will be after the WTC, because obviously that's what I'm focused on uh, up until that happens. But I, th I thought I'd put out a little, little teaser. Uh, so watch this space. And boosted gun. Hey! Tickets are up for sale, so you can search for BoostedCon and buy one. It's a song, Quali Geeks posted it. Yep. So you can find it on their page if you follow them um, for Boosted Rolls. Uh, boosted, is it Boosted Rolls Tournament? Con? Boosted Con. Boosted Con. God damn it. Mixed it all up. <laughs> right. Um, and on that terrible note, thank you very much for joining us, gents. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, hope you have a good evening and catch you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yep, take care.